Section 5 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1, by Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. Section 5. On the Heptameron. Part 1. It is probable that every one who has had much to do with the study of literature has conceived certain preferences for books which he knows not to belong absolutely to the first order, but which he thinks to have been unjustly depreciated by the general judgment, and which appeal to his own tastes or sympathies with particular strength. One of such books in my own case is The Heptameron of Margaret of Navarre. I have read it again and again sometimes at short intervals, sometimes at longer, during the lapse of some five-and-twenty years since I first met with it. But the place which it holds in my critical judgment and in my private affections has hardly altered at all since the first reading. I like it as a reader, perhaps rather more than I esteem it as a critic, but even as a critic, and allowing fully for the personal equation, I think that it deserves a far higher place than is generally accorded to it. Three mistakes, as it seems to me, pervade most of the estimates, critical or uncritical, of the heptameron, the two first of old date, the third of recent origin. The first is that it is a comparatively feeble imitation of a great original, and that any one who knows Boccaccio need hardly trouble himself to know Margaret of Navarre. The second is that it is a loose, if not obscene book, disgraceful for a lady to have written, or at least mothered and not very creditable for any one to read. The third is that it is interesting as the gossip of a certain class of modern newspapers is interesting, because it tells scandal about distinguished personages, and has for its interlocutors other distinguished personages, who can be identified without much difficulty, and the identification of whom adds zest to the reading. All these three seem to me to be mistakes of fact and of judgment. In the first place, the heptameron burrows from its original literally nothing but plan. Its stories are quite independent. The similarity of name is only a bookseller's invention, though a rather happy one, and the personal setting, which is in Boccaccio a mere framework, has here considerable substance and interest. In the second place, the accusation of looseness is wildly exaggerated. There is one very coarse, but not in the least immoral, story in the Heptameron. There are several broad jests on the obnoxious cloister and its vices. There are many tales which are not intended virginibus puerisque. And there is a pervading flavour of that half-French, half-Italian courtship of married women, which was at this time usual everywhere out of England. The manners are not our manners and what may be called the moral tone is distinguished by a singular cast, of which more presently. But if not entirely a book for boys and girls, the heptameron is certainly not one which Southey need have accepted from his admirable answer in the character of author of The Doctor, to the person who wondered whether he, Southey, could have daughters, and if so, whether they liked reading. He has daughters, they love reading, and he is not the man I take him for if they are not allowed to open any book in his library. The last error, if not so entirely inconsistent with intelligent reading of the book as the first and second, is scarcely less strange to me. For, in the first place, the identification of the personages in the framework of the heptameron depends upon the merest and, as it seems to me, the idlest conjecture and, in the second, the interests of the actual tittle-tattle, whether it could be fathered on A or B or not, is the least part of the interest of the book. Indeed, the stories altogether are, as I think, far less interesting than the framework. Let us see, therefore, if we cannot treat the heptameron in a somewhat different fashion from that in which any previous critic, even St. Beuve, has treated it. The divisions of such treatment are not very far to seek. In the first place, let us give some account of the works of the same class which preceded and perhaps patterned it. In the second, let us give an account of the supposed author, of her other works, and of the probable character of her connection with this one. 
In the third, without attempting dry argument, let us give some sketch of the vital part which we have called the framework, and some general characteristics of the stories. And, in the fourth and last, let us endeavour to disengage that peculiar tone, flavour, note, or whatever word may be preferred, which, as it seems to me at least, at once distinguishes the heptameron from other books of the kind, and renders it peculiarly attractive to those whose temperament and taste predisposes them to be attracted. For there is a great deal of pre-established harmony in literature and literary tastes, and I have a kind of idea that every man has his library marked out for him when he comes into the world, and has then only got to get the books and read them. Margaret herself refers openly enough to the example of the Decameron, which had been translated by her own secretary, Anthony Le Masson, a member of her literary coterie, and not improbably connected with the writing or redacting of the Heptameron itself. Nor were later Italian tale-tellers likely to be without influence at a time when French was being Italianated in every possible way, to the great disgust of some Frenchmen. But the Italian ancestors or patterns need not be dealt with here, and can be discovered with ease and pleasure by any one who wishes, in the drier pages of Dunlop, or in the more flowery and starry pages of Mr. Simmons' History of the Renaissance in Italy. The next few pages will deal only with the French tale-tellers, whose productions before Margaret's days were, if not very numerous, far from uninteresting and whose influence on the slight difference of genre which distinguishes the tales before us from Italian tales was by no means slight. In France, as everywhere else, prose fiction, like prose of all kinds, was considerably later in production than verse, and short tales of the kind before us were especially postponed by the number, excellence, and popularity of the verse fabliaux. Of these, large numbers have come down to us, and they exactly correspond in verse to the tales of the Decameron and the Heptameron in prose, except that the satirical motive is even more strongly marked, and that touches of romantic sentiment are rarer. This element of romance, however, appears abundantly in the long prose versions of the Arthurian and other legends, and we have a certain number of short prose stories of the 13th and 14th centuries, of which the most famous is that of Aucassin et Nicolette. These latter, however, are rather short romances than distinct prose tales of our kind. Of that kind, the first famous book in French, and the only famous book, besides the one before us, is the Sans Nouvelle Nouvelle. The authorship of this book is very uncertain. It purports to be a collection of stories told by different persons of the society of Louis XI, when he was but Dauphin, and was in exile in Flanders, under the protection of the Duke of Burgundy. But it has of late years been very generally assigned, though on rather slender grounds of probability, and none of positive evidence, to Anthony de la Salle, the best French prose writer of the fifteenth century, except Comines, and one on whom, with an odd unanimity, conjectural criticism has bestowed, besides his acknowledged romance of late chivalrous society Petit Jean de Saint-Tré, a work which itself has some affinities with the class of story before us, not only the Sans Nouvelles Nouvelles, but the famous satirical treatise of the Quinze Joies du Mariage, and the still more famous farce of Patelin. Some of the Nouvelles, moreover, have been putatively fathered on Louis XI himself, in which case the royal house of France would boast of two distinguished tale-tellers instead of one, However this may be, they all display the somewhat hard and grim, but keen and practical humour which seems to have distinguished that prince, which was a characteristic of French thought and temper at the time, and which perhaps arose with the misfortunes and hardships of the Hundred Years' War. The stories are decidedly amusing, with a considerably greater, though also a much ruder, vis comica, than that of the Heptameron, and they are told in a style unadorned indeed, and somewhat dry, lacking the simplicity of the older French, and not yet attaining to the graces of the newer, but forcible, distinct, and sculpturesque, if not picturesque. A great license of subject and language, an enjoyment of practical jokes of the roughest, not to say the most cruel character, prevail throughout, and there is hardly a touch of anything like romance. 
the tales alternating between jests as broad as those of the Reeves and Miller's tales in Chaucer, themselves exactly corresponding to Verse Fabliaux, of which the Saint Nouvelle are exact prose counterparts and perhaps prose versions, and examples of what has been called the humour of the stick, which sometimes trenches hard upon the humour of the gallows and the torture chamber. These characteristics have made the Saint Nouvelle Nouvelle no great favourites of late, but their unpopularity is somewhat undeserved. For all their coarseness, there is much genuine comedy in them, and if the prettiness of romantic and literary dressing up is absent from them, so likewise is the insincerity thereof. They make one of the most considerable prose books of what may be called middle French literature, and they had much influence on the books that followed, especially on this of Margaret's. Indeed, one of the few examples to be found between the two, the Grand Paragon de Nouvelle Nouvelle of Nicole de Troyes, 1535, obviously takes them for model. But Nicolas was a dull dog, and neither profited by his model, nor gave anyone else opportunity to profit by himself. Rabelais, the first book of whose Pantagruel anticipated the Paragon by three years, while the Gargantua coincided with it, was a great authority at the court of Margaret's brother Francis, dedicated one of the books, the third, of Pantagruel to her before her death, in high-flown language, as Esprit abstrait, ravi et extatique, and must certainly have been familiar reading of hers, and of all the ladies and gentlemen, literary and fashionable, of her court. But there is little resemblance to be found in his style and hers, the short stories which Master Francis scatters about his longer work are, indeed, models of narration, but his whole tone of thought and manner of treatment are altogether alien from those of the ravished spirit whom he praises. His deliberate coarseness is not more different from her deliberate delicacy than his intensely practical spirit from her high-flown romanticism, which makes one think of, and may have suggested, the court of la quinte and her mixture of devout and amatory quadlibitation from his cynical criticism and all dissolving irony but there was a contemporary of rabelais who forms a kind of link between him and margaret whose work in part is very like the heptameron and who has been thought to have had more than a hand in it this was bonaventure d'esperier a man whose history is as obscure as his works are interesting. Born in or about the year 1500, he committed suicide in 1544, either during a fit of insanity, or, as has been thought more likely, in order to escape the danger of the persecution which, in the last years of the reign of Francis, threatened the unorthodox, and which Margaret, who had more than once warded it off from them, was then powerless to avert. Desperier, to speak the truth, was in far more danger of the stake than most of his friends. The infidelity of Rabelais is a matter of inference only, and some critics, among whom the present writer ranks himself, see in his daring ridicule of existing abuses nothing inconsistent with a perfectly sound, if liberally conditioned, orthodoxy. Desperier, like Rabelais, was a Lucianist, but his modernizing of Lucian, the remarkable book called Symbalum Mundi, though pretending to deal with ancient mythology, as an almost unmistakable reference to revealed religion. It is not, however, by this work or by this side of his character at all that Desperier is brought into connection with the work of Margaret, who, if learned and liberal, and sometimes tending to the new ideas in religion, was always devout and always orthodox in fundamentals. Besides the Symbalum Mundi, he has left a curious book not published, like the heptameron itself, till long after his own death, and entitled Nouvelles Recreations et Joyeux de Vie. The tales of which it consists are for the most part very short, some being rather sketches or outlines of tales than actually worked out stories, so that, although there are no less than a hundred and twenty-nine of them, the whole book is probably not half the bulk of the heptameron itself. But they are extremely well written, and the specially interesting thing about them is that in them there appears, and appears for the first time, unless we take the heptameron itself as earlier, which is contrary to all probability, the singular and, at any rate, to some persons, 
very attractive mixture of sentiment and satire, of learning and the love of refined society, of joint devotion to heavenly and earthly love, of voluptuous enjoyment of the present, blended and shadowed with the sense of the night that cometh, which delights us in the prose of the Heptameron, and in the verse not only of all the Pleiad poets in France, but of Spencer, Don, and some of their followers in England. The scale of the stories, which are sometimes mere anecdotes, is so small, the room for miscellaneous discourse in them is so scanty, and the absence of any connecting links, such as those of Margaret's own plan, checks the expression of personal feeling so much that it is only occasionally that this cast of thought can be perceived. But it is there, and its presence is an important element in determining the question of the exact authorship of the Heptameron itself. It can hardly be said that, except translations from the Italian, of which the close intercourse between France and Italy in the days of the later Valois produced many, Margaret had many other examples before her. For such a book as the Propos Rustique of Noël du Fer, though published before her death, is not likely to have exercised any influence over her, and most other books of the kind are later than her own. One such, for despite its bizarre title and its distinct intention of attacking the Roman Church, Henri Estienne's Apologie pour Hérodote is really a collection of stories, deserves mention, not because of its influence upon the Queen of Navarre, but because of the Queen of Navarre's influence upon it. Estienne is constantly quoting the Tamaron, and though to a certain extent the inveteracy with which the friars are attacked here must have given the book a special attraction for him, two things may be gathered from his quotations and attributions. The first is that the book was a very popular one, the second that there was no doubt among well-informed persons of whom and in whose company Estienne most certainly was, that the Heptameron was in more than name the work of its supposed author. From what went before it, Margaret could and could not borrow certain well-defined things. Models both Italian and French gave her the scheme of including a large number of short and curtly but not skimpingly told stories in one general framework, and of subdividing them into groups dealing more or less with the same subject or class of subject. She had also in her predecessors the example of drawing largely on that perennial and somewhat facile source of laughter, the putting together of incidents and phrases which even by those who laugh at them are regarded as indecorous but of this expedient she availed herself rather less than any of her forerunners. She had further the example of a generally satirical intent, but here too she was not content merely to follow, and her satire is, for the most part, limited to the corruptions and abuses of the monastic orders. It can hardly be said that any of the other stock subjects, lawyers, doctors, citizens, even husbands, for she is less satirical on marriage than ecomiastic of love, are dealt with much by her. She found also in some, but chiefly in older books of the Chartier and still earlier traditions, and rather in Italian than in French, a certain strain of romance proper and of adventure, but of this also she availed herself but rarely. What she did not find in any example, unless, and then but partially, in the example of her own servant Bonaventure d'Esperier, was first the interweaving of a great deal not merely of formal religious exercise, but of positive religious devotion in her work, and secondly the infusing into it of the peculiar Renaissance contrast so often to be noticed of love and death, passion and piety, voluptuous enjoyment and sombre anticipation. But it is now time to say a little more about the personality and work of this lady, whose name all this time we have been using freely, and who was indeed a very notable person, quite independently of her literary work. Nor was she in literature by any means an unnotable one, quite independently of the collection of unfinished stories which, after receiving at its first posthumous publication the not particularly appropriate title of Les Amants Fortunés, was more fortunately renamed, albeit by something of a bull, for there is the beginning of an eighth day, as well as the full complement of the seven, the Heptameron. Few ladies have been known in history by more and more confusing titles 
than the author of the heptameron the confusion arising partly from the fact that she had a niece and a great-niece of the same charming christian name as herself the second margaret de valois the most appropriate name of all three as it was theirs by family right was the daughter of francis i the patroness of ronsard and somewhat late in life the wife of the duke of savoy a marriage which as the bride carried with her a dowry of territory was not popular and brought some coarse jests on her not much is said of her personal appearance after her infancy but she inherited her aunt's literary tastes if not her literary powers and gave ronsard powerful support in his early days the third was the daughter of henry the second the grosse margot of her brother henry the third the reine margot of dumas novel the idol of brantome the first wife of henry the fourth the beloved of guise la mole and a long succession of gallants the rival of her sister-in-law mary stuart not in misfortunes but as the most beautiful gracious learned accomplished and amiable of the ladies of her time this margaret would have been an almost perfect heroine of romance for she had every good quality except chastity if she had not unluckily lived rather too long her great-aunt our present subject was not the equal of her great-niece in beauty her portraits being rendered uncomely by a portentously long nose longer even than mrs citizens and by a very curious expression of the eyes going near to slyness but the face is one which can be imagined as much more beautiful than it seems in the not very attractive portraiture of the time and her actual attractions are attested by her contemporaries with something more than the homage to order which literary men have never failed to pay to ladies who are patronesses of letters besides margaret of valois she is known as margaret of angouleme from her place of birth and her father's title margaret of alencon from the fief of her first husband margaret of navarre of which country like her grandniece she was queen by her second marriage with henri de la Bre. and even margaret of orleans as belonging to the orleans branch of the royal house she was not like her nieces margaret of france as her father never reigned and brantome probably denies her the title but others sometimes give it when it is necessary to call her anything besides the simple margaret angouleme is at once the most appropriate and the most distinctive designation she was born on the eleventh or twelfth of april fourteen ninety two her father being charles count of angouleme and her mother louise of savoy she was their eldest child and two years older than her brother the future king francis according to and even in excess of the custom of the age she received a very learned education acquiring not merely the three tongues french italian and spanish which were all in common use at the french court during her time but latin and even a little greek and a little hebrew she lived in the provinces both before and after her marriage in fifteen o nine to her relation charles duke of alencon who was older than herself by three years and though a fair soldier and an inoffensive person was apparently of little talents and not particularly amiable the accession of her brother to the throne opened a much more brilliant career to her she and her mother jointly exercised great influence over francis and the duchess of alencon to whom her brother shortly afterwards gave berry was for many years one of the most influential persons in the kingdom using her influence almost invariably for good her husband died soon after pavia and in the same year september fifteen twenty five she undertook a journey to spain on behalf of her captive brother this journey with some expressions in her letters and in brantome has been wrested by some critics in order to prove that her affection for francis was warmer than it ought to have been an imputation wanton in both senses of the word she was sought in marriage by or offered in marriage to divers distinguished persons during her widowhood and this was also the time of her principal diplomatic exercise an office for which odd as it now seems for a woman she had like her mother like her niece catherine of medicis like her namesake margaret of parma and like other ladies of the age 
a very considerable aptitude and reputation. When she at last married, the match was not a brilliant one, though it proved, contrary to immediate probability, to be the source of the last and the most glorious branch of the royal dynasty of France. The bridegroom bore indeed the title of King of Navarre, and possessed Béarn, but his kingdom had long been in Spanish hands, and but for his wife's dowry of Alençon and appanage of Berry, to which Francis had added Armagnac and a large pension, he would have been but a lackland. Furthermore, he was eleven years younger than herself, and it is at least insinuated that the affection, if there was any, was chiefly on her side. At any rate, this earlier Henry of Navarre seems to have had not a few of the characteristics of his grandson, together with a violence and brutality which, to do the fair Galant justice, formed no part of his character. The only son of the marriage died young, and the girl, Jane d'Albret, mother of the great Bourbon race of the next two centuries, was taken away from her parents by reasons of state for a time. The domestic life of Margaret, however, concerns us but little, except in one way. Her husband disliked administration, and she was the principal ruler in their rather extensive estates or dominions. Moreover, she was able, at her quasi-court, to extend the literary coteries which she had already begun to form at Paris. The patronage to men of letters, for which her brother is famous, was certainly more due to her than to himself, and to her also was due the partial toleration of religious liberty which for a time distinguished his reign. It was not till her influence was weakened that intolerance prevailed, and she was able even then for a time to save Marot and other distinguished persons from persecution. It is rather a moot point how far she inclined to the reformed doctrines, properly so called. Her letters, his serious and poetical work, and even the heptameron itself, show a fervently pietistic spirit and occasionally seem to testify to a distinct inclination towards Protestantism, which is also positively attested by Brantome and others. But this Protestantism must have been, so far as it was consistent and definite at all, the Protestantism of Erasmus rather than of Luther, of Rabelais rather than of Calvin. She had a very strong objection to the coarseness, the vices, the idleness, the brutish ignorance of the cloister, she had aspirations after a more spiritual form of religion than the ordinary Catholicism of her day provided, and, as a strong politician, she may have had something of that Gallicanism which has always been well marked in some of the best Frenchmen, and which at one time nearly prevailed with her great-great-grandson, Louis the Fourteenth. But there is no doubt that, as her brother said to the fanatical Montmorency, she would always have been, and always was, of his religion, the religion of the state, the side of the Reformation which must have most appealed to her was neither its austere morals, nor its bare ritual, nor its doctrines, properly so called, but its spiritual pietism and its connection with profane learning and letters. For of literature, Margaret was an ardent devotee and a constant practitioner. Her best days were done by the time of her second marriage. After the king's return from Spain, persecution broke out, and Margaret's influence became more and more weak to stop it. As early as 1533, her own Miroir de l'âme Pécheresse, then in a second edition, provoked the fanaticism of the Sorbonne, and the king had to interfere in person to protect his sister's work and herself from gross insult. The Medici marriage increased the persecuting tendency, and for a time there was even an attempt to suppress printing, and with it all that new literature which was the Queen's delight. She was herself in some danger, but Francis had not sunk so low as to permit any actual attack to be made on her. Yet all the last years of her life were unhappy, though she continued to keep court at Nérac in Pau, to accompany her brother in his progresses, and, as we know from documents, to play Lady Bountiful over a wide area of France. Her husband appears to have been rather at variance with her, and her daughter, who married first, and in name only, the Duke of Cleves in 1540, and later, 1548, Anthony de Bourbon, was also not on cordial terms with her mother. By the date of this second marriage, Francis was dead, and though he had for many years been anything but wholly kind, 
Margaret's good days were now in truth done. Her nephew Henry left her in possession of her revenues, but does not seem to have been very affectionately disposed towards her, and even had she been inclined to attempt any recovery of influence, his wife and his mistress, Catherine de Medici and Diana of Poitiers, two women as different from Margaret as they were from one another, would certainly have prevented her from obtaining it. As a matter of fact, however, she had long been in ill health, and her brother's death seems to have dealt her the final stroke. She survived it two years, even as she had been born two years before him, and died on the 21st December 1549 at the castle of Odo, near Tarbes, having lived in almost complete retirement for a considerable time. Her husband is said to have regretted her dead more than he loved her living, and her literary admirers, such of them as death and exile had spared, were not ungrateful. Tombeaux, or collections of funeral verses, were not lacking, the first being in Latin, and oddly enough, nominally by three English sisters, Anne, Margaret, and Jane Seymour, nieces of Henry the Eighth's queen and Edward the Sixth mother, with learned persons like Dora, Saint Marthe, and Baif. This was reissued in French and in a fuller form later. End of section five. Section 6 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. By Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. Section 6 on the Heptameron, Part 2. Some reference has been made to an atrocious slur cast without a shred of evidence on her moral character. There is as little foundation for more general though milder charges of laxity. It is admitted that she had little love for her first husband, and it seems to be probable that her second had not much love for her. She was certainly addressed in gallant strains by men of letters, the most audacious being Clement Marot but the almost universal reference of the well-known and delightful lines beginning un doux nanny avec un doux sourire to her method of dealing not merely with this lover but with others argues a general confidence in her being a virtuous coquette if somewhat coquettishly virtuous it may be added that the whole tone of the heptameron points to a very similar conclusion her literary work was very considerable and it falls under three divisions letters the book before us and the very curious and interesting collection of poems known by the charming if fantastic title of les marguerites de la marguerite des princesses a play on the meanings daisy pearl and margaret which had been popular in the artificial school of french poetry since the end of the thirteenth century in a vast number of forms the letters are naturally of the very first importance for determining the character of margaret's life as a woman of business a diplomatist and so forth they show her to us in all these capacities and also in that of an enlightened and always ready patroness of letters and of men of letters further they are of value though their value is somewhat affected by a reservation to be made immediately as to her mental and moral characteristics but they are not of literary interest at all equal to that of either of the other divisions they are if not spoiled still not improved by the fact that the art of easy letter-writing, in which French women of the next century were to show themselves such proficients, had not yet been developed, and that most of them are couched in a heavy, laborious, semi-official style, which smells, as far as mere style goes, of the cumbrous refinements of the rhetoriqueurs, in whose flourishing time Margaret herself grew up, and which conceals the writer's sentiments under elaborate forms of ceremonial courtesy something at least of the groundless scandal before referred to is derived in all probability if not in all certainty from the lavish use of hyperbole in addressing her brother and generally speaking the rebuke of the queen to polonius more matter with less art is applicable to the whole correspondence something of the same evil influence is shown in the marguerite 
It must be remembered that the writer died before the Pleiad movement had been fully started, and that she was older by five years than Marot, the only one of her own contemporaries and her own literary circle who attained to a poetic style easier, freer, and more genuine than the cumbrous rhetoric partly derived from the allegorizing style of the Roman de la Rose and its followers, partly influenced by corrupt following of the rediscovered and scarcely yet understood classics, partly alloyed with Flemish and German and Spanish stiffness, of which Chatelain, Cretin, and the rest have been the frequently quoted and the rarely read exponents to students of French literature. The contents of the Marguerite, to take the order of the beautiful edition of M. Félix Franck, are as follows. Volume 1 contains first a long and singular religious poem entitled Le Miroir de l'âme Pécheresse, in rhymed decasyllables, in which pretty literal paraphrases of a large number of passages of scripture are strung together with a certain amount of pious comment and reflection. This is followed, after a shorter piece on the contest in the human soul between the laws of the spirit and of the flesh, by another poem of about the same length as the miroir, and of no very different character, entitled Oraison de l'âme fidèle à son Seigneur Dieu and the shorter Oraison à notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ completes the volume. The second volume yields four so-called comedies, but really mysteries on the old medieval model, only distinguishable from their forerunners by slightly more modern language and a more scriptural tone. The subjects are the Nativity, the Adoration of the Three Kings, the Massacre of the Innocents, and the Flight into Egypt. The third volume contains a third poem in the style of the miroir, but much superior, Le Triomphe de l'Agneau, a considerable body of spiritual songs, a miscellaneous poem or two, and some epistles chiefly addressed to Francis. These last begin the smaller and secular division of the Marguerite, which is completed in the fourth volume by Les Quatre Dames et Les Quatre Gentilhommes composed of long monologues after the fashion of the Froissart Chartier school by a comédie profane, a farce entitled Trop Prou Peu Moins, a long love poem, again in the Chartier style, entitled La Coche, and some minor pieces. Opinion as to these poems has varied somewhat, but their merit has never been put very high, nor, to tell the truth, could it be put high by anyone who speaks critically. In the first place, they are written for the most part on very bad models, both in general plan and in particular style and expression. The plan is, as has been said, taken from the long-winded allegorical erotic poetry of the very late thirteenth, the fourteenth, and the fifteenth centuries, poetry which is now among the most difficult to read in any literature. The groundwork or canvas being transferred from love to religion, it gains a little in freshness and directness of purpose, but hardly in general readableness. Thus, for instance, two whole pages of the miroir, or some forty or fifty lines, are taken up with endless playings on the words mort and vie, and their derivatives, such as mortifié and mort vie, mort vivifié and vie mourante. The sacred comedies or mysteries have the tediousness and lack of action of the older pieces of the same kind without their naivete, and pretty much the same may be said of the profane comedy, which is a kind of morality, and of the farce. Of La Coche, what has been said of the long sacred poems may be said, except that here we go back to the actual subject of the models, not on the whole with advantage, while in the minor pieces the same word plays and frigid conceits are observable. But if this somewhat severe judgment must be passed on the poems as wholes, and from a certain point of view, it may be considerably softened when they are considered more in detail. In not a few passages of the religious poems Margaret has reached, and as she had no examples before her except Marot's psalms, which were themselves later than at least some of her work, may be said to have anticipated that grave and solemn harmony of the French Huguenots of the sixteenth century, which in Du Bartin, in Agrippa d'Aubigny, and in passages of the tragedian Mont Christian, strikes notes hardly touched elsewhere in French literature. The Triomphe de Lagneau displays her at her best in this respect, 
and not unfrequently comes not too far off from the apocalyptic resonance of Daubigny himself. Again, the Bergerie, included in the nativity comedy or mystery, though something of a Dresden Bergerie, to use a later image, is graceful and elegant enough in all conscience. But it is on the minor poems, especially the epistles and the chansons spirituelles, that the defenders of Margaret's claim to be a poet rest most strongly. In the former, her love, not merely for her brother, but for her husband, appears unmistakably, and suggests graceful thoughts. In the latter, the force and fire which occasionally break through the stiff wrappings of the longer poems appear with less difficulty and in fuller measure. It is, however, undoubtedly curious, and not to be explained merely by the difference of subject, that the styles of the letters and of the poems, agreeing well enough between themselves, differ most remarkably from that of the heptameron. The two former are decidedly open to the charges of pedantry, artificiality, and heaviness. There is a great surplusage of words and a seeming inability to get to the point. The heptameron, if not equal in narrative vigour and lightness to Boccaccio before and La Fontaine afterwards, is not in the least exposed to the charge of clumsiness of any kind, employs a simple, natural, and sufficiently picturesque vocabulary, avoids all verbiage and roundabout writing, and both in the narratives and in the connecting conversation displays a very considerable advance upon nearly all the writers of the time, except Rabelais, Marot, and Desperier, in easy command of the vernacular. It is, therefore, not wonderful that there has, at different times, rather less of late years, but that is probably an accident, been a disposition, if not to take away from Margaret all the credit of the book, at any rate to give a share of it to others. In so far as this share is attempted to be bestowed on ladies and gentlemen of her court or family, there is very little evidence for it. But in so far as the pen may be thought to have been sometimes held for her by the distinguished men of letters just referred to, there is no reason why Master Francis himself should not have sometimes guided it, and by others only less distinguished, there is considerable internal reason to favour the idea. At all times and in all places, in France perhaps more than anywhere else, kings and queens, lords and ladies, have found no difficulties. We need not use the harsh Voltairean, Carlylean phrase and say in getting their literary work buckwashed, but in getting it pointed and seasoned, trimmed and ornamented by professional men of letters. The form of the tamaron lends itself more than any other to such assistance, and while I should imagine that the setting, with its strong colour, both of religiosity and amorousness, is almost wholly Margaret's work, I should also think it so likely as to be nearly certain that in some at least of the tales the hands of the authors of the Symbolum Mundi and the Adolescence Clementine, of Le Masson and Brodeau, may have worked at the devising, very likely reshaped and adjusted by the Queen herself, of the actual stories as we have them now. The book, as we have it, consists of seven complete days of ten novels each, and of an eighth containing two novels only. The fictitious scheme of the setting is somewhat less lugubrious than that of the Decameron, but still not without an element of tragedy. On the 1st of September, when the hot springs of the Pyrenees begin to enter upon their virtue, a company of persons of quality assembled at Cotteret, we are told, and abode there three weeks with much profit. But when they tried to return, rain set in with such severity that they thought the deluge had come again, and they found their roads, especially that to the French side, almost entirely barred by the Gave de Béarn and other rivers. So they scattered in different directions, most of them taking the Spanish side, either along the mountains and across to Roussillon, or straight to Barcelona, and thence home by sea. But a certain widow, named Oisille, made her way with much loss of men and horses to the Abbey of Notre-Dame de Serrance. Here she was joined by diverse gentlemen and ladies, who had had even worse experiences of travel than herself, with bears and brigands and other evil things, so that one of them, Longarine, had lost her husband, murdered in an affray in one of the cut-throat inns always dear to romance. Besides this disconsolate person and Oisille, the company consisted 
of a married pair, Hircan and Parlamente, two young cavaliers, Dagoussin and Safredante, two young ladies, Nomerfide and Anna Suite, Simonteau, a cavalier servant of Parlamente, and Geberon, a knight older and discreeter than the rest of the company, except Oisille. These form the party, and it is to be noted that idle and contradictory as all the attempts made to identify them have been, for instance, the most confident interpreters hesitate between Oisille and Parlamente, an aged widow and a youthful wife, for Margaret herself, it is not to be denied that the various parts are kept up with much decision and spirit. Of the men, indeed, Hercan is the only one who has a very decided character, and is represented as fond of his wife, Parlamente, but a decided libertine, and of a somewhat rough and ruthless general character, points which have made the interpreters sure that he must be Henri d'Albret. The others, except that Geburon is, as has been said, older than his companions, and that Simonteau sighs vainly after Parlamente, are merely walking gentlemen of the time, accomplished enough, but not individual. The women are much more distinct, and show a woman's hand. Oisille is, as our own seventeenth-century ancestors would have said, ancient and sober, very devout, regarded with great respect by the rest of the company, and accepted as a kind of mistress both of the revels and of more serious matters, but still a woman of the world, and content to make only an occasional and mild protest against tolerably free stories and sentiments. Parlamente, considerably younger, and though virtuous, not by any means ignorant of or wholly averse to the devotion of Simonteau, indulging occasionally in a kind of mild conjugal sparring with her husband, Hircan, but apparently devoted to him, full of religion and romance and refinement at once, is a very charming character, resembling Madame de Sévigné, as she may have been in her unknown or hardly known youth, when husband and lovers alike were attracted by the flame of her beauty and charm, only to complain that it froze and did not burn. Longarine is discreetly unhappy for her dead husband, but appears decidedly consolable. And a sweet is a haughty damsel, disdainful of poor folk, and Nomafide is a pure madcap, a Catherine Satan of the generation before Catherine herself, the feminine Dionio of the party, and, if a little too free-spoken for prudish modern taste, a very delightful girl. Now when this good company had assembled at Serrance and told each other their misadventures, the waters on inquiry seemed to be out more widely and more dangerously than before, so that it was impossible to think of going farther for the time. They deliberated, accordingly, how they should employ themselves, and, after allowing, on the proposal of Oisille, an ample space for sacred exercises, they resolved that every day, after dinner, and at interval, they should assemble in a meadow on the bank of the Gave at midday and tell stories. The device is carried out with such success that the monks steal behind the hatches to hear them, and an occasional postponement of Vespers takes place. Simonteau begins, and the system of tale-telling goes round on the usual plan of each speaker naming him or her who shall follow. It should be observed that no general subject is, as in the Decameron, prescribed to the speakers of each day, though, as a matter of course, one subject often suggests another of not dissimilar kind. Nor is there the Decameronic arrangement of the king— between the stories, and also between the days, there is often a good deal of conversation, in which the diverse characters, as given above, are carried out with a minuteness very different from the chief Italian original. From what has been said already, it will be readily perceived that the novels, or rather their subjects, are not very easy to class in any rationalized order. The great majority, if they do not answer exactly to the old title of Les Histoires des Amants Fortunés, are devoted to the eternal subject of the tricks played by wives to the disadvantage of husbands, by husbands to the disadvantage of wives, and sometimes by lovers to the disadvantage of both. Subtilité is a frequent word in the titles, and it corresponds to a real thing. Another large division, trenching somewhat upon the first, is composed of stories to the discredit of the monks. Something, though less, is said against the secular clergy, and especially of the Cordeliers, or Franciscans, 
an order who for their coarse immorality and their brutal antipathy to learning were the special black or rather grey beasts of the literary reformers of the time in a considerable number there are references to actual personages of the time references which stand on a very different footing of identification from the puerile guessings at the personality of the interlocutors so often referred to sometimes these references are avowed un des muletiers de la reine de navarre le roi françois montre sa générosité un président de grenoble une femme d'alasson and so forth at other times the reference is somewhat more covert but hardly to be doubted as in the remarkable story of a great prince obviously francis himself who used on his journeyings to and from an assignation of a very illegitimate character to turn into a church and piously pursue his devotions there are a few curious stories in which amatory matters play only a subordinate part or none at all though it must be confessed that this last is a rare thing some are mere anecdote plays on words sometimes pretty free and then generally told by nomafide or quasi-historical such as that already noticed of the generosity of francis to a traitor or deal with remarkable trials and crimes or merely miscellaneous matters the best of the last class being the capital bon invention pour chasser le lutin in so large a number of stories with so great a variety of subjects it naturally cannot but be the case that there is a considerable diversity of tone but that peculiarity at which we have glanced more than once the combination of voluptuous passion with passionate regret and a mystical devotion is seldom absent for long together the general note indeed of the heptameron is given by more than one passage in brantome at greatest length by one which saint beuf has rightly quoted at the same time and also rightly rebuking the sceptical abbe's determination to see in it little more than a piece of precieuse manliness though indeed the precieuses were not yet yet even saint beuf has scarcely pointed out quite strongly enough how entirely this is the key note of all margaret's work and especially of the heptameron the story therefore may be worth telling again though it may be found in the cinquième discours of the vie des dames galantes brantome's brother not yet a captain in the army but a student travelling in italy had in sojourning at ferrara when renée of france was duchess fallen in love with a certain mademoiselle de la roche for love of him she had returned to france and visiting his own country of gascony had attached herself to the court of margaret where she had died and it happened that bourdeille six months afterwards and having forgotten all about his dead love came to pau and went to pay his respects to the queen he met her coming back from vespers and she greeted him graciously and they talked of this matter and of that but as they walked together hither and thither the queen drew him without cause shown into the church she had just left where mademoiselle de la roche was buried cousin said she do you feel nothing stirring beneath you and under your feet but he said nothing madame think cousin then said she once again but he said madame i have thought well but i feel naught for under me there is but a stone hard and firmly set now do i tell you said the queen leaving him no longer at study that you are above the tomb and the body of mademoiselle de la roche who is buried beneath you and whom you loved so much in our lifetime and since our souls have sense after our death it cannot be but that this faithful one dead so lately felt your presence as soon as you came near her and if you have not perceived it because of the thickness of the tomb doubt not that none the less she felt it and forasmuch as it is a pious work to make memory of the dead and notably of those whom we loved i pray you give her a pater and an ave and likewise a de profundis and pour out holy water so shall you make a quist of the name of a right faithful lover and a good christian and she left him that he might do this brantome though he had an admiration for margaret whose lady of honour his grandmother had been and who according to the bourdeille tradition 
composed her novels in travelling, thought this a pretty fashion of converse. Voilà, he says, l'opinion de cette bonne princesse, laquelle la tenait plus par gentillesse et par forme de dévie que par créance à mon avis. Saint Beuf, on the contrary, and with better reason, sees in it faith, graciousness, feminine delicacy, and piety at once. No doubt, but there is something more than this, and that something more is what we are in search of, and what we shall find, now in one way, now in another, throughout the book, something whereof the sentiment of Don's famous thoughts on the old lover's ghost, on the blanched bone with its circlet of golden tresses, is the best-known instant in English. The madcap nomer feed indeed lays it down that the meditation of death cools the heart not a little, but her more experienced companions know better. The worst side of this Renaissance peculiarity is told in the last tale, a rather ghastly story of monkish corruption. Its lighter side appears in the story, already referred to, of the Grand Prince, and his pious devotions on the way to not particularly pious occupation. But touches of the more poetical and romantic effects of it are all over the book. It is to be found in the story of the gentleman who forsook the world because of his beloved's cruelty, whereat she, repenting, did likewise. He'd much better have thrown away his cow and married her, quoth the practical no more feed, in that of the wife who, to obtain freedom of living with her paramour, actually allowed herself to be buried. In that, very characteristic of the time, especially for the touch of farce in it, of the unlucky person to whom phlebotomy and love together were fatal, and in not a few others, while it emerges in casual phrases of the intermediate conversations and of the stories themselves, even when it is not to be detected in the general character of the subjects. And thus we can pretty well decide what is the most interesting and important part of the whole subject. The question, what is the special virtue of the heptameron, I have myself little hesitation in answering. There is no book, in prose and of so early a date, which shows to me the characteristic of the time as it influenced the two great literary nations of Europe so distinctly as this book of Margaret of Angoulême. Take it as a book of court gossip, and it is rather less interesting than most books of court gossip, which is saying much. Take it as the performance of a single person, and you are confronted with a difficulty that it is quite unlike that other person's more certain works, and that it is in all probability a joint affair. Take its separate stories, and, with rare exceptions, they are not of the first order of interest, or even of the second. But separate the individual purport of these stories from the general colour or tone of them. Take this general colour or tone in connection with the tenor of the intermediate conversations, which form so striking a characteristic of the book, and something quite different appears. It is that same peculiarity which appears in places and persons and things so different as Spencer, as the poetry of the Pleiad, as Montaigne, as Raleigh, as Donne, as the group of singers known as the Caroline Poets. It is a peculiarity which has shown itself in different forms at different times, but never in such vigour and precision as at this time. It combines a profound and certainly sincere, almost severe, religiosity with a very vigorous practice of some things which the religion it professes does not at all countenance. It has an almost morbidly pronounced simultaneous sense of the joys and the sorrows of human life, the enjoyment of the joys being perfectly frank, and the feeling of the sorrows not in the least sentimental. It unites a great general refinement of thought, manners, opinion, with an almost astonishing occasional coarseness of opinion, manners, thought. The prevailing note in it is a profound melancholy, mixed with flashes and intervals of a no less profound delight. There is in it the sense of death, to a strange and at first sight almost unintelligible extent. Only when one remembers the long night of the religious wars which was just about to fall on France, just as after Spencer, Puritan as he was, after Carew and Herrick still more, a knight of a similar character was about to fall on England. Does the real reason of this singular idiosyncrasy appear? The company of the Atamron are the latest representatives, at first hand, 
and with no deliberate purpose of resentment, of the medieval conception of gentlemen and ladies who fleeted the time goldenly. They are not themselves any longer medieval. They have been taught modern ways. They have a kind of uneasy sense, even though one and another of themselves may now and then flout the idea, of the importance of other classes, even of some duty on their own part towards other classes. Their piety is a very little deliberate. Their voluptuous indulgence has a grain of conscience in it and behind it, which distinguishes it not less from the frank indulgence of a Greek or a Roman than from the still franker naivete of purely medieval art, from the childlike, almost paradisiac innocence of the Bellissons and Nicolettes and of the daughter of the great Solon Yu in that wonderful serio-comic chanson of the Voyage à Constantinople. The mark of modernity is on them, and yet they are so little conscious of it, and so perfectly free from even the slightest touch of at least its anti-religious influence. Nobody, not even Hercan, the Gramont of the sixteenth century, not even Nomerfide, the Miss Notable of her day and society, not even the haughty lady Enesfite, who wonders whether common folk can be supposed to have like passions with us, feels the abundant religious services and the periods of meditation unconscionable or tiresome. And so we have here three notes constantly sounding together or in immediate sequence. There is the passion of that exquisite rondeau of Marot's, which some will have, perhaps not impossibly, to refer to Margaret herself. En la bazon m'a dit, Ami sans blâme, c'est seul baiser qui deux bouches en bas. Les arts sont du bien tant d'espéré, ce mot elle a doucement proféré. Pensant du tout apaisé ma grande flamme, mais le mien cœur a donc plus elle en flamme, car son haleine odorant plus que bam, souffla le feu qu'amour m'a préparé en la baissant. Bref, mon esprit, sans cognoissance d'âme, fit voir alors sur la bouche à madame, dont se mourra les corps enamourés, et si la lèvre eut guère démouré, contre la mienne, et me succès l'âme en la baissant. There is a devout meditation of Voici, and that familiarity with the scriptures which, as Hercan himself says, I trow we all read and know. And then there is the note given by two other curious stories of Brantome. One tells how the Queen of Navarre watched earnestly for hours by the bedside of a dying maid of honour, that she might see whether the parting of the soul was a visible fact or not. The second tells how when some talked before her of the joys of heaven, she sighed and said, Well, I know that this is true, but we dwell so long dead underground before we arise thither. There, in a few words, is the secret of the heptameron, the fear of God, the sense of death, the voluptuous longing and voluptuous regret for the good things of life and love that pass away. George Sainsbury, London, October 1892 Footnote As I have spoken so strongly of the attempt to identify the personages of the heptameron, it might seem discourteous not to mention that one of the most enthusiastic and erudite English students of Margaret, Madame Darmestetter, Miss Mary Robinson, appears to be convinced of the possibility and advisableness of discovering these originals. Everything that this lady writes is most agreeable to read, but I fear I cannot say that her arguments have converted me. End of section 6「Section seven of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume One by margaret of navarre translated by george saintsbury dedications and preface 
prefixed to the first two editions of the tales of the queen of navarre to the most illustrious most humble and most excellent princess madame margaret de bourbon duchess of nevers marchioness of isle countess of eu of dro retellois colombier and beaufort lady of aspremont of chambrano of arche roncar montbron and la chapelle d'angillon peter boischu surnamed Launay, offers most humble salutation and perpetual obedience footnote this dedicatory preface appeared in the first edition of queen margaret's tales published by boischu in fifteen fifty eight under the title of histoire des amants fortunés the princess addressed was the daughter of charles duke of vendome she was wedded in fifteen thirty eight to francis of cleve duke of nevers and by this marriage became niece to the queen of navarre editor and footnote madam that great oracle of god st john chrysostom deplores with infinite compassion in some part of his works the disaster and calamity of his century in which not only was the memory of an infinity of illustrious persons cut off from among mankind but what is more their writings by which the rich conceptions of their souls and the divine ornaments of their minds were to have been consecrated to posterity did not survive them and certainly with most manifest reason did this good and holy man address such a complaint to the whole christian republic touched as he was with just grief for an infinity of thousands of books of which some have been lost and buried in eternal forgetfulness by the negligence of men others dispersed and destroyed by the cruel incursions of war others rotted and spoiled as much by the rigor of time as by the carelessness to collect and preserve them whereof the ancient histories and annals furnish a sufficient example in the memorable library of that great king of egypt ptolemy philadelphus which had been formed with the sweat and blood of so many notable philosophers and maintained ordered and preserved by the liberality of that great monarch and yet in less than a day by the monstrous and abominable cruelty of the soldiers of caesar when the latter followed pompey to alexandria it was burned and reduced to ashes zonarius the ecclesiastical historian writes that the same happened at constantinople in the time of zeno when a superb and magnificent palace adorned with all sorts of manuscript books was burnt to the eternal regret and insupportable detriment of all those who made a profession of letters and without amusing ourselves too curiously in recounting the destruction among the ancients we have in our time experienced a similar loss of which the memory is so recent that the wounds thereof still bleed in all parts of europe namely when the turks besieged buda the capital of hungary where the most celebrated library of the good king matthias was pillaged dispersed and destroyed a library which without sparing any expense he had enriched with all the rarest and most excellent books greek latin hebrew and arabic that he had been able to collect in all the most famous provinces of the earth again he who would particularize and closely examine things will find that theophrastes as he himself declares wrote and composed three hundred volumes chrysippus sixty 
empedocles fifty servus sulpicius two hundred on civil law gallienus one hundred and thirty on the art of medicine and origines six thousand all of which st jerome attests having read and yet of so many admirable and excellent authors there now remain to us only some little fragments so debased and vitiated in several places that they seem abortive and as if they had been torn from their author's hands by force on account of which my lady since the occasion has offered i have been minded to present all these examples with the object of exhorting all those who treasure books and keep them sequestered in their sanctuaries and cabinets to henceforth publish them and bring them to light not only so that they may not keep back and bury the glory of their ancestors but also that they may not deprive their descendants of the profit and pleasure which they might derive from the labor of others in regard to myself i will set forth more amply in the notice which i will give to the reader the motive that induced me to put my hand to the work of the present author who has no need of trumpet and herald to exalt and magnify her greatness inasmuch as there is no human eloquence that could portray her more forcibly than she has portrayed herself by the celestial strokes of her own brush footnote in the french text west jew invariably refers to the author as a personage of the masculine sex with the evident object of concealing the real authorship of the work feminine pronouns have however been substituted in the translation as it is queen margaret who is referred to editor and footnote i mean by her other writings in which she has so well expressed the sincerity of her doctrines the vivacity of her faith and the uprightness of her morals that the most learned men who reigned in her time were not ashamed to call her a prodigy and miracle of nature and albeit that heaven jealous of our welfare has snatched her from this mortal habitation yet her virtues rendered her so admirable and so engraved her in the memory of every one that the injury and lapse of time cannot efface her from it for we shall ceaselessly mourn and lament for her like antimachus the greek poet wept for lacidicia his wife with sad verses and delicate elegies which describe and reveal her virtues and merits therefore my lady as this work is about to be exposed to the doubtful judgment of so many thousands of men may it please you to take it under your protection and into your safe keeping for whereas you are the natural and legitimate heiress of all the excellences ornaments and virtues which enriched the author while she adorned by her presence the purprise of the earth and which now by some marvellous ray of divinity live and display themselves in you it is not possible that you should be defrauded of the fruit of the labor which justly belongs to you and for which the whole universe will be indebted to you now that it comes forth into the light under the resplendent shelter of your divine and heroic virtues may it therefore please you my lady to graciously accept of this little offering as an eternal proof of my obedience and most humble devotion to your greatness pending a more important sacrifice which i prepare for the future peter boisteu surnamed Lonay, to the reader footnote this notice follows the dedicatory preface in the edition of fifteen fifty eight 
End footnote. Gentle reader, I can tell thee verily, and with good right assert, even prove by witnesses worthy of belief, when this work was presented to me that I might fulfill the office of a sponge and cleanse it of a multitude of manifest errors that were found in a copy written by hand i was only requested to take out or copy eighteen or twenty of the more notable tales reserving myself to complete the rest at a more convenient season and at greater leisure however as men are fond of novelties i was solicited with very pressing requests to pursue my point to which i consented rather by reason of the importunity than of my own will and my enterprise was conducted in such fashion that so as not to show myself in any wise disobedient i added some more tales to which again others have since been adjoined in regard to myself i can assure thee that it would have been less difficult for me to build the whole edifice anew than to mutilate it in several places change innovate add and suppress it in others but i was almost perforce compelled to give it a new form which i have done partly for the requirements and the adornment of the stories partly to conform to the times and the infelicity of our century when most human things are so exulcerated that there is no work however well digested polished and filed but it is badly interpreted and slandered by the malice of fastidious persons take therefore in good part our hasty labor and be not too close a censor of another's work until thou hast examined thine own to the most illustrious and virtuous princess madame jane de foix queen of navarre claude gruget her very humble servant presents salutation and wishes of felicity footnote this preface was inserted in the edition issued in fifteen fifty nine by claude gruget who gave the title of heptameron to queen margaret's tales and footnote i would not have interfered madam to present you with this book of the tales of the late queen your mother if the first edition had not omitted or concealed her name and almost entirely changed its form to such a point that many did not recognize it on which account to render it worthy of its author i as soon as it was divulged gathered together from all sides the copies i could collect of it written by hand verifying them by my copy and acting in such wise that i arranged the book in the real order in which she had drawn it up then with the permission of the king and your consent it was sent to the press to be published such as it should be concerning it i am reminded of what count balthazar says of boccaccio in the preface to his courtier footnote the libro del cortegiano by count baldassare castiglione was the nobleman's vade mecum of the period first published at venice in fifteen twenty eight it was translated into french in fifteen thirty seven by j collin secretary to francis i editor and footnote that what he had done by way of pastime namely his decameron had brought him more honor than all his other works in latin or tuscan which he esteemed the most serious thus the queen the true ornament of our century from whom you do not derogate in the love and knowledge of good letters 
while amusing herself with the acts of human life has left such beauteous instructions that there is no one who does not find matter of erudition in them and indeed according to all good judgment she has surpassed boccaccio in the beautiful discourses which she composes upon each of her tales for which she deserves praise not only over the most excellent ladies but also among the most learned men for of the three styles of oration described by cicero she has chosen the simple one similar to that of terence in latin which to every one seems very easy to imitate though it is anything but that to him who tries it it is true that such a present will not be new to you and that you will only recognize in it the maternal inheritance however i feel assured that you will receive it favorably at seeing it in this second impression restored to its original state for according to what i have heard the first displeased you not that he who put his hand to it was not a learned man or did not take trouble indeed it is easy to believe that he was not minded to disguise it thus without some reason nevertheless his work has proved unpleasing i present it to you then madam not that i pretend to any share in it but only as having unmasked it to restore it to you in its natural state it is for your royal greatness to favor it since it proceeds from your illustrious house whereof it bears the mark upon the front which will serve it as a safe conduct throughout the world and render it welcome among good company as for myself recognizing the honor that you will do me in receiving from my hand the work thus restored to its right state i shall ever feel obliged to render you most humble duty End of section seven. Section eight of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume One by margaret of navarre translated by george sainsbury prologue on the first day of september when the baths in the pyrenee mountains begin to be possessed of their virtue there were at those of cauteret many persons as well of france as of spain some to drink the water others to bathe in it and again others to make trial of the mud all these being remedies so marvellous that persons despaired of by the doctors return thence wholly cured my purpose is not to speak to you of the situation or virtue of the said baths but only to set forth as much as relates to the matter of which i desire to write all the sick persons continued at the baths for more than three weeks until by the amendment in their condition they perceived that they might return home again but while they were preparing to do so there fell such extraordinary rains that it seemed as though god had forgotten the promise he made to noah never to destroy the world with water again for every cottage and every lodging in cauteret was so flooded with water that it was no longer possible to continue there those who had come from the side of spain returned thither across the mountains as best they could and such of them as knew whither the roads led fared best in making their escape the french lords and ladies thought to return to tarbes as easily as they had come but they found the streamlets so deep as to be scarcely fordable when they came to pass over the bernese gave which at the time of their former passage had been less than two feet in depth they found it so broad and swift 
that they turned aside to seek for the bridges. But these, being only of wood, had been swept away by the turbulence of the water. Then certain of the company thought to stem the force of the current by crossing in a body, but they were quickly carried away, and the others, who had been about to follow, lost all inclination to do so. Accordingly they separated, as much because they were not all of one mind as to find some other way. Some crossed over the mountains, and passing through Aragon, came to the county of Roussillon, and thence to Narbonne, whilst others made straight for Barcelona, going thence by sea, some to Marseilles, and others to aigues mortes But a widow lady of long experience, named Wassy, resolved to lay aside all fear of bad roads, and to betake herself to Our Lady of Serence. She was not, indeed, so superstitious as to think that the glorious virgin would leave her seat at her son's right hand to come and dwell in a desolate country, but she was desirous to see the hallowed spot of which she had so often heard, and further she was sure that if there were a means of escaping from a danger, the monks would certainly find it out. At last she arrived, after passing through places so strange and so difficult in the going up and coming down, that, in spite of her years and weight, she had perforce gone most of the way on foot. But the most piteous thing was that the greater part of her servants and horses were left dead on the way, and she had but one man and one woman with her on arriving at Sarans, where she was charitably received by the monks. There were also among the French two gentlemen who had gone to the baths rather that they might be in the company of the ladies whose lovers they were than because of any failure in their health. These gentlemen, seeing that the company was departing and that the husbands of their ladies were taking them away, resolved to follow them at a distance without making their design known to any one. But one evening, while the two married gentlemen and their wives were in the house of one who was more of a robber than a peasant, the two lovers, who were lodged in a farmhouse hard by, heard about midnight a great uproar. They got up, together with their serving-men, and inquired what this tumult meant. The poor man, in great fear, told them that it was caused by certain evil-doers who were come to share the spoil which was in the house of their fellow bandit. Thereupon the gentlemen immediately took their arms, and with their serving-men set forth to succour the ladies, esteeming it a happier thing to die for them than to outlive them. When they reached the house they found the first door broken through, and the two gentlemen with their servants defending themselves valiantly. But inasmuch as they were outnumbered by the robbers, and were also sorely wounded, they were beginning to fall back having already lost many of their servants. The two gentlemen, looking in at the windows, perceived the ladies shrieking and sobbing so bitterly that their hearts swelled with pity and love at the sight, and, like two enraged bears coming down from the mountains, they fell upon the bandits with such fury that many of them were slain, while the remainder, unwilling to await their onset, fled to a hiding-place which was known to them. When the gentleman had worsted these rogues, and had slain the host himself among the rest, they heard that the man's wife was even worse than her husband, and they therefore sent her after him with a sword thrust. Then they entered a lower room, where they found one of the married gentlemen on the point of death. The other had received no hurt, save that his clothes were all pierced with thrusts, and that his sword was broken in two. The poor gentleman, perceiving what help the two had afforded him, embraced and thanked them, and besought them not to abandon him, which was to them a very agreeable request. When they had buried the dead gentleman, and had comforted his wife as well as they were able, they took the road which God set before them, not knowing whither they were going. If it pleases you to know the names of the three gentlemen, the married one was called Hircan, and his wife Parlamente, the name of the widow being Longarine. Of the two lovers, one was called Dagoussin, and the other Saffredan. After having been the whole day on horseback, towards evening they descried a belfry, whither, with toil and trouble, they made the best of their way, 
and on their arrival were kindly received by the abbot and the monks. The abbey is called saint Servin. The abbot, who came of an ancient line, lodged them honourably, and when taking them to their apartments, inquired of them concerning their adventures. When he had heard the truth, he told them that others had fared as badly as they, for in one of his rooms he had two ladies who had escaped a like danger, or perchance a greater, inasmuch as they had had to do with beasts and not with men. Half a league on this side of Perechit, the poor ladies had met with a bear coming down from the mountain, before whom they had fled with such speed that their horses fell dead under them at the abbey gates. Further, two of their women, who arrived a long time afterwards, had made report that the bear had killed all the serving-men. Then the two ladies and the three gentlemen entered the room where these unhappy travellers were, and found them weeping. They recognised them to be Nomerfide and Anna Sweet, whereupon they all embraced and recounted what had befallen them. At the exhortations of the good abbot they began to take comfort in having found one another again, and in the morning they heard mass with much devotion, praising God for the perils from which they had escaped. While they were all at mass there came into the church a man clad only in a shirt, fleeing as though he were pursued, and crying out for aid. Forthwith, Hircan and the other gentlemen went to meet him to see what the affair might mean, and perceived two men behind him with drawn swords. These, on seeing so great a company, sought to fly, but they were hotly pursued by Hircan and his companions, and so lost their lives. When Hircan came back, he found that the man in the shirt was one of his companions, named Gébron, who related to them how, while he was in bed at a farmhouse near Perechit, three men came upstairs, and how he, although he was in his shirt and had no other weapon but his sword, had stretched one of them on the ground, mortally wounded. While the other two were occupied in raising their companion, he, perceiving himself to be naked and the others armed, bethought him that he could not outdo them except it were by flight as being the least encumbered with clothes. And so he had escaped, and for this he praised God and those who had avenged him. When they had heard Mass and had dined, they sent to see if it was possible to cross the river Gave, and on learning that it was not, they were in great dismay. However, the abbot urgently entreated them to stay with him until the water had abated, and they agreed to remain for that day. In the evening, as they were going to bed, there arrived an aged monk, who was wont to come in September of every year to Our Lady of Serence. They inquired of him concerning his journey, and he told them that on account of the floods he had come over the mountains and by the worst roads he had ever known. On the way he had seen a very pitiful sight. He had met a gentleman named Simonteau, who, wearied by his long waiting for the river to subside and trusting to the goodness of his horse, had tried to force a passage, and had placed all his servants round about him to break the force of the current. But when they were in the midst of the stream, those who were the worst mounted were swept away, horses and men, down the stream, and were never seen again. The gentleman, finding himself alone, turned his horse to go back, but before he could reach the bank his horse sank under him. Nevertheless, God willed that this should happen so close to the bank that the gentleman was able, by dragging himself on all fours, and not without swallowing a great deal of water, to scramble out onto the hard stones, though he was then so weak and weary that he could not stand upright. By good fortune, a shepherd, bringing back his sheep at even, found him seated among the stones, wet to the skin, and sad not only for himself, but on account of his servants, whom he had seen perish before his eyes. The shepherd, who understood his need even better from his appearance than from his speech, took him by the hand and led him to his humble dwelling, where he kindled some faggots, and so dried him in the best way that he could. The same evening God led thither this good monk, who showed him the road to Our Lady of Serence, assuring him that he would be better lodged there than anywhere else, and would there find an aged widow named Wasille, who had been as unfortunate as himself. 
when all the company heard tell of the good lady Wasille and the gentle knight Simonteau, they were exceedingly glad and praised the creator who, content with the sacrifice of serving folk, had preserved their masters and mistresses. And more than all the rest did Parlamente give hearty praise to God, for Simonteau had long been her devoted lover. Then they made diligent inquiry concerning the road to Serrance, and although the good old man declared it to be very difficult, they were not to be debarred from attempting to proceed thither that very day. They set forth well furnished with all that was needful, for the abbot provided them with wine and abundant victuals, and with willing companions to lead them safely over the mountains. These they crossed more often on foot than on horseback, and after much toil and sweat came to Our Lady of Serrance. Here the abbot, although somewhat evilly disposed, durst not deny them lodging for fear of the Lord of Beern, who, as he was aware, held them in high esteem. Being a true hypocrite, he showed them as fair a countenance as he could, and took them to see the Lady Wasille and the gentle knight Simonteau. The joyfulness of all this company who had been thus miraculously brought together was so great that the knight seemed short to them while praising God and the church for the goodness that he had shown to them. When towards morning they had taken a little rest, they all went to hear Mass and receive the holy sacrament of fellowship, in which all Christians are joined together as one, imploring him who of his mercy had thus united them, that he would further their journey to his glory. After they had dined, they sent to learn whether the waters were at all abated, and found that, on the contrary, they were rather increased, and could not be crossed with safety for a long time to come. They therefore determined to make a bridge, resting on two rocks, which come very close together, and where there are still planks for those foot-passengers who, coming from Oleron, wish to avoid crossing at the ford. The abbot was well pleased that they should make this outlay, to the end that the number of pilgrims might be increased, and he furnished them with workmen, though he was too avaricious to give them a single farthing. The workmen declared that they could not finish the bridge in less than ten or twelve days, and all the company, both ladies and gentlemen, began to grow wary. But Parlamente, who was Hircan's wife, and who was never idle or melancholy, asked leave of her husband to speak, and said to the aged Lady Wasille, "'I am surprised, madam, that you who have so much experience, and now fill the place of mother to all of us women, do not devise some pastime to relieve the weariness we shall feel during our long stay, for if we have not some pleasant and virtuous occupation, we shall be in danger of falling ill.' "'Nay,' added the young widow Longarine, "'worse than that we shall become ill-tempered, which is an incurable disease.' for there is not one among us but has cause to be exceeding downcast, having regard to our several losses. And a sweet, laughing, replied, Every one has not lost her husband like you, and the loss of servants need not bring despair, since others may readily be found. Nevertheless, I too am of opinion that we should have some pleasant exercise with which to while away the time, for otherwise we shall be dead by to-morrow." All the gentlemen agreed with what these ladies said, and begged Wasi to tell them what they should do. "'My children,' she replied, "'you ask me for something which I find very difficult to teach you, namely, a pastime that may deliver you from your weariness. I have sought for such a remedy all my life, and have never found but one, which is the reading of the Holy Scriptures. In them the mind may find that true and perfect joy from which repose and bodily health proceed. If you would know by what means I continue so blithe and healthy in my old age, it is because on rising I immediately take up the holy scriptures and read therein, and so perceive and contemplate the goodness of God who sent his Son into the world to proclaim to us the sacred word and glad tidings by which he promises the remission of all sins and the satisfaction of all deaths by the gift that he has made us of his love, passion, and merits. 
the thought of this gives me such joy that i take my psalter and in all humility sing with my heart and utter with my lips the sweet psalms and canticles which the holy spirit put into the heart of david and of other writers and so acceptable is the contentment that this brings to me that any evils which may befall me during the day i look upon as blessings seeing that i have in my heart through faith him who has borne them all for me in the same way before supper i retire to feed my soul by reading and then in the evening i call to mind all i have done during the past day in order that i may ask forgiveness for my sins thank him for his mercies and feeling safe from all harm take my rest in his love fear and peace this my children is the pastime i have long practised after making trial of all others and finding in none contentment of spirit i believe that if you give an hour every morning to reading and then offer up devout prayers during mass you will find in this lonely place all the beauty that any town could afford one who knows god sees all things fair in him and without him everything seems uncomely wherefore i pray you accept my advice if you would live in gladness then hircan took up the discourse and said those madam who have read the holy scriptures as i believe we all have done will acknowledge that what you have said is true you must however consider that we are not yet so mortified that we have not need of some pastime and bodily exercise when we are at home we have the chase and hawking which cause us to lay aside a thousand foolish thoughts and the ladies have their household cares their work and sometimes the dance in all which they find honourable exercise so speaking on behalf of the men i propose that you who are the oldest read to us in the morning about the life that was led by our lord jesus christ and the great and wonderful works that he did for us and that between dinner and vespers we choose some pastime that shall be pleasant to the body and yet not hurtful to the soul in this way we shall pass the day cheerfully the lady Wasille replied that she had been at pains to forget every description of worldly vanity and she therefore feared that she should succeed but ill in the choice of such an entertainment the matter must be decided by the majority of opinions and she begged hircan to set forth his own first for my part said he if i thought that the pastime i should choose would be as agreeable to the company as to myself my opinion would soon be given for the present however i withhold it and will abide by what the rest shall say his wife parlamente thinking he referred to her began to blush and half in anger and half laughing replied perhaps hircan she who you think would find it most dull might readily find means of compensation had she a mind for it but let us leave aside a pastime in which only two can share and speak of one that shall be common to all since my wife has understood the meaning of my words so well said hircan to all the ladies and a private pastime is not to her liking i think she will be better able than any one else to name one that all may enjoy and i herewith give in to her opinion having no other of my own to this all the company agreed parlamente perceiving that it had fallen to her to decide spoke as follows did i find myself as capable as the ancients who invented the arts i should devise some sport or pastime in fulfilment of the charge you lay upon me but knowing as i do my knowledge and capacity which are scarcely able to recall the worthy performances of others i shall think myself happy if i can follow closely such as have already satisfied your request among the rest i think there is not one of you who has not read the hundred tales of boccaccio lately translated from the italian into french so highly were these thought of by king francis first of that name monseigneur the dauphin madame de dauphiness and madame margaret that could boccaccio have only heard them from the place where he lay the praise of such illustrious persons would have raised him from the dead now i heard not long since that the two ladies i have mentioned together with several others of the court determined to do like boccaccio with however one exception 
they would not write any story that was not a true one. And the sad ladies, and Monseigneur the Dauphin with them, undertook to tell ten stories each, and to assemble in all ten persons, from among those whom they thought the most capable of relating something. Such as had studied and were people of letters were accepted, for Monseigneur the Dauphin would not allow of their art being brought in, fearing lest the flowers of rhetoric should in some wise prove injurious to the truth of the tales. But the weighty affairs in which the king had engaged, the peace between him and the king of England, the bringing to bed of the Dauphiness, and many other matters of a nature to engross the whole court, caused the enterprise to be entirely forgotten. By reason, however, of our now great leisure, it can be accomplished in ten days, whilst we wait for our bridge to be finished. If it so pleased you, we might go every day from noon till four of the clock, into yonder pleasant meadow beside the river Gave. The trees there are so leafy that the sun can neither penetrate the shade nor change the coolness to heat. Sitting there at our ease, we might each one tell a story of something we have ourselves seen or heard related by one worthy of belief. At the end of ten days we shall have completed the hundred, and if God wills it that our work be found worthy in the eyes of the lords and ladies I have mentioned, we will on our return from this journey present them with it, in lieu of images and paternosters, and feeling assured that they will hold this to be a more pleasing gift. If, however, any one can devise some plan more agreeable than mine, I will fall in with his opinion. All the company replied that it was not possible to give better advice, and that they had waited the morning in impatience in order to begin. Thus they spent that day joyously, reminding one another of what they had seen in their time. As soon as the morning was come, they went to the room of Madame Oisille, whom they found already at her prayers. They listened to her reading for a full hour, then piously heard mass, and afterwards went to dinner at ten o'clock. After dinner, each one withdrew to his chamber, and did what he had to do. According to their plan, at noon they failed not to return to the meadow, which was so fair and pleasant that it would need a boccaccio to describe it as it really was. Suffice to say that the fairer was never seen. When the company were all seated on the green grass, which was so fine and soft that they needed neither cushion nor carpet, Simonteau commenced by saying, "'Which of us shall begin before the others?' "'Since you were the first to speak,' replied Hercan, "'tis reasonable that you should rule us, for in sport we are all equal.' "'Would to God,' said Simonteau, I had no worse fortune in this world than to be able to rule all the company present. On hearing this, Parlamente, who well knew what it meant, began to cough. Hercan, therefore, did not perceive the colour that came into her cheeks, but told Simonteau to begin, which he did as presently follows. End of section 8. Prologue. Section 9 of The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1, by Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. Section 9. First Day... Tale one. Footnote. The incidents of this story are historical, and occurred in Alençon and Paris between 1520 and 1525. End footnote. Ladies, said Simonteau, I have been so poorly rewarded for my long service, that to avenge myself upon love, and upon her who treats me so cruelly, I shall be at pains to make a collection of all the ill turns that women have done to hapless men, and moreover I will relate nothing but the simple truth. In the town of Alençon, during the lifetime of Charles, the last duke, footnote, the duke Charles here alluded to is Margaret's first husband, and footnote, there was a proctor named saint Aignan who had married a gentlewoman of the neighbourhood. She was more beautiful than virtuous, and on account of her beauty and light behaviour, 
was much sought after by the Bishop of Sais, who, in order to compass his ends, managed the husband so well that the latter not only failed to perceive the vicious conduct of his wife and of the bishop, but was further led to forget the affection he had always shown in the service of his master and mistress. Thus, from being a loyal servant, he became utterly adverse to them, and at last sought out sorcerers to procure the death of the duchess. Footnote. This was, of course, Margaret herself. End footnote. Now, for a long time, the bishop consorted with this unhappy woman, who submitted to him from avarice rather than from love, and also because her husband urged her to show him favour. But there was a youth in the town of Alençon, son of the lieutenant-general, whom she loved so much that she was half crazy regarding him, and she often availed herself of the bishop to have some commission entrusted to her husband, so that she might see the son of the lieutenant, who was named Dumenil, at her ease. This mode of life lasted a long time, during which she had the bishop for her profit, and the said du Menil for her pleasure. To the latter she swore that she showed a fair countenance to the bishop only that their own love might the more freely continue, that the bishop, in spite of appearances, had obtained only words from her, and that he, du Menil, might rest assured that no man save himself should ever receive aught else. One day, when her husband was setting forth to visit the bishop, she asked leave of him to go into the country, saying that the air of the town was injurious to her, and, when she had arrived at her farm, she forthwith wrote to Dumanil to come and see her, without fail, at about ten o'clock in the evening. This the young man did, but as he was entering at the gate, he met the maid, who was one to let him in, and who said to him, "'Go elsewhere, friend, for your place is taken.' Supposing that the husband had arrived, he asked her how matters stood. The woman, seeing that he was so handsome, youthful and well-bred, and was withal so loving and yet so little loved, took pity upon him, and told him of his mistress's wantonness, thinking that on hearing this he would be cured of loving her so much. She related to him that the bishop of Sais had but just arrived, and was now in bed with the lady, a thing which the latter had not expected, for he was not to have come until the morrow. However, he had detained her husband at his house, and had stolen away at night to come secretly and see her. If ever man was in despair, it was de Menil, who nevertheless was quite unable to believe the story. He hid himself, however, in a house nearby, and watched until three hours after midnight, when he saw the bishop come forth disguised, yet not so completely but that he could recognize him more readily than he desired. Du Menil, in his despair, returned to Alençon, whither, likewise, his wicked mistress soon came, and went to speak to him, thinking to deceive him according to her wont. But he told her that, having touched sacred things, she was too holy to speak to a sinner like himself, albeit his repentance was so great that he hoped his sin would very soon be forgiven him. When she learned that her deceit was found out, and that excuses, oaths, and promises never to act in a like way again, were of no avail, she complained of it to her bishop. Then, having weighed the matter with him, she went to her husband, and told him that she could no longer dwell in the town of Alençon, for the lieutenant's son, whom he had so greatly esteemed among his friends, pursued her unceasingly to rob her of her honour. She therefore begged of him to abide at Argentan, in order that all suspicion might be removed. The husband, who suffered himself to be ruled by his wife, consented, but they had not long been at Argentan when this bad woman sent a message to Dumenil, saying that he was the wickedest man in the world, for she knew full well that he had spoken evilly of her and of the bishop of Sais. However, she would strive her best to make him repent of it. The young man, who had never spoken of the matter except to herself, and who feared to fall into the bad graces of the bishop, repaired to Argentan with two of his servants, and finding his mistress at Vespers in the church of the Jacobins, he went and knelt beside her and said, I am come hither, madam, to swear to you before God that I have never spoken of your honour to any person but yourself. You treated me so ill that I did not make you half the reproaches you deserved, but if there be man or woman ready to say that I have ever spoken of the matter to them, I am here to give them the lie in your presence." Seeing that there were many people in the church, and that he was accompanied by two stout serving-men, 
she forced herself to speak as graciously as she could. She told him that she had no doubt he spoke the truth, and that she deemed him too honourable a man to make evil report of any one in the world, least of all of herself, who bore him so much friendship. But since her husband had heard the matter spoken of, she begged him to say in his presence that he had not so spoken and did not so believe. To this he willingly agreed, and, wishing to attend her to her house, he offered to take her arm. But she told him it was not desirable that he should come with her, for her husband would think that she had put these words into his mouth. Then, taking one of his serving-men by the sleeve, she said, "'Leave me this man, and as soon as it is time I will send him to seek you. Meanwhile do you go and rest in your lodging.' He, having no suspicion of her conspiracy against him, went thither. She gave supper to the serving-man, whom she had kept with her and who frequently asked her when it would be time to go and seek his master, but she always replied that his master would come soon enough. When it was night, she sent one of her own serving-men to fetch Dumenil, and he, having no suspicion of the mischief that was being prepared for him, went boldly to St. Agnès' house. As his mistress was still entertaining his servant there, he had but one with himself. Just as he was entering the house, the servant who had been sent to him told him that the lady wished to speak with him before he saw her husband, and that she was waiting for him in a room where she was alone with his own serving-man. He would therefore do well to send his other servant away by the front door. This he did. Then, while he was going up a small dark stairway, the proctor saint Agnon, who had placed some men in ambush in a closet, heard the noise and demanded what it was whereupon he was told that a man was trying to enter secretly into his house. At the moment, a certain Thomas Guerin, a murderer by trade, who had been hired by the proctor for the purpose, came forward and gave the poor young man so many sword thrusts that whatever defence he was able to make could not save him from falling dead in their midst. Meanwhile the servant who was waiting with the lady said to her, "'I hear my master speaking on the stairway. I will go to him.' But the lady stopped him and said, "'Do not trouble yourself. He will come soon enough.' A little while afterwards the servant, hearing his master say, "'I am dying. May God receive my soul,' wished to go to his assistance, but the lady again withheld him, saying, "'Do not trouble yourself. My husband is only chastising him for his follies. We will go and see what it is.' Then, leaning over the balustrade at the top of the stairway, she asked her husband, "'Well, is it done?' "'Come and see,' he replied. "'I have now avenged you on the man who put you to such shame.' So saying, he drove a dagger that he was holding ten or twelve times into the belly of a man whom, alive, he would not have dared to assail. When the murder had been accomplished, and the two servants of the dead man had fled to carry the tidings to the unhappy father, saint Agnon bethought himself that the matter could not be kept secret, but he reflected that the testimony of the dead man's servants would not be believed, and that no one in his house had seen the deed done except the murderers, and an old woman-servant, and a girl fifteen years of age. He secretly tried to seize the old woman, but, finding means to escape out of his hands, she sought sanctuary with the Jacobins, and was afterwards the most trustworthy witness of the murder. The young maid remained for a few days in St. Agnon's house, but he found means to have her led astray by one of the murderers, and had her conveyed to a brothel in Paris, so that her testimony might not be received. To conceal the murder, he caused the corpse of the hapless dead man to be burned, and the bones which were not consumed by the fire he caused to be placed in some mortar in a part of his house where he was building. Then he sent in all haste to the court to sue for pardon, setting forth that he had several times forbidden his house to a person whom he suspected of plotting his wife's dishonour and who, notwithstanding his prohibition, had come by night to see her in a suspicious fashion, whereupon, finding him in the act of entering her room, his anger had got the better of his reason, and he had killed him. But before he was able to dispatch his letter to the chancellors, the duke and duchess had been apprised by the unhappy father of the matter, and they sent a message to the chancellor to prevent the granting of the pardon. Finding he could not obtain it, the wretched man fled to England with his wife and several of his relations. But before setting out, he told the murderer, who at his entreaty had done the deed, that he had seen expresses from the king directing that he should be taken and put to death. 
Nevertheless, on account of the service that he had rendered him, he desired to save his life, and he gave him ten crowns wherewith to leave the kingdom. The murderer did this, and was afterwards seen no more. The murder was so fully proven by the servants of the dead man, by the woman who had taken refuge with the Jacobins, and by the bones that were found in the mortar, that legal proceedings were begun and completed in the absence of Saint-Aignan and his wife. They were judged by default, and were both condemned to death. Their property was confiscated to the prince, and fifteen hundred crowns were to be given to the dead man's father to pay the costs of the trial. Saint-Aignan, being in England, and perceiving that in the eyes of the law he was dead in France, by means of his services to diverse great lords, and by the favour of his wife's relations, induced the King of England to request the King of France to grant him a pardon, and to restore him to his possessions and honours. But the King of France, having been informed of the wickedness and enormity of the crime, sent the process to the King of England, praying him to consider whether the offence was one deserving of pardon, and telling him that no one in the kingdom but the Duke of Alençon had the right to grant a pardon in that duchy. However, notwithstanding all his excuses, he failed to appease the King of England, who continued to entreat him so very pressingly that, at his request, the proctor at last received a pardon, and so returned to his own home. Footnote. The letters of remission which were granted to Saint-Aignan on this occasion will be found in the appendix of the first day. It will be noted that Margaret in her story gives various particulars which Saint-Aignan did not fail to conceal in view of obtaining his pardon. End footnote. There, to complete his wickedness, he consorted with a sorcerer named Gallery, hoping that by this man's art he might escape payment of the fifteen hundred crowns to the dead man's father. To this end he went in disguise to Paris with his wife. She, finding that he used to shut himself up for a great while in a room with Gallery, without acquainting her with the reason thereof, spied upon him one morning, and perceived Gallery showing him five wooden images, three of which had their hands hanging down, whilst two had them lifted up. "'We must make waxen images like these,' said Gallery, speaking to the proctor. "'Such as have their arms hanging down will be for those whom we shall cause to die, and the others with their arms raised will be for the persons from whom you would fain have love and favour. "'This one,' said the proctor, "'shall be for the king by whom I would fain be loved, and this one for Monseigneur Brinon, Chancellor of Alençon.' The images, said Gallery, must be set under the altar, to hear mass, with words that I will presently tell you to say. Then, speaking of those images that had their arms lowered, the proctor said that one should be for Master Gilles du Menil, father of the dead man, for he knew that as long as the father lived he would not cease to pursue him. Moreover, one of the women with her hands hanging down was to be for the Duchess of Alençon, sister to the king for she bore so much love to her old servant, Du Menil, and had in so many other matters become acquainted with the proctor's wickedness, that except she died, he could not live. The second woman that had her arms hanging down was his own wife, who was the cause of all his misfortune, and who he felt sure would never amend her evil life. When his wife, who could see everything through the keyhole, heard him placing her among the dead, she resolved to send him among them first. On pretense of going to borrow some money, she went to an uncle she had, named Nofle, who was master of requests to the Duke of Alençon, and informed him of what she had seen and heard. Nofle, like the old and worthy servant that he was, went forthwith to the Chancellor of Alençon, and told him the whole story. As the Duke and Duchess of Alençon were not at court that day, the Chancellor related this strange business to the Regent, mother of the king and the duchess, and she sent in all haste for the provost of Paris, who made such speed that he at once seized the proctor and his sorcerer, Gallery. Without constraint or torture, they freely confessed their guilt, and their case was made out and laid before the king. Certain persons, wishing to save their lives, told him that they had only sought his good graces by their enchantments. But the king, holding his sister's life as dear as his own, commanded that the same sentence should be passed on them as if they had made an attempt on his own person. However, his sister, the Duchess of Alençon, 
and treated that the proctor's life might be spared and the sentence of death be commuted to some heavy punishment this request was granted her and saint aignan and gallery were sent to the galleys of saint blancard at marseilles where they ended their days in close captivity and had leisure to ponder on the grievousness of their crimes the wicked wife in the absence of her husband continued in her sinful ways even more than before and at last died in wretchedness i pray you ladies consider what evil is caused by a wicked woman and how many evils sprang from the sins of the one i have spoken of you will find that ever since eve caused adam to sin all women have set themselves to bring about the torment slaughter and damnation of men for myself i have had such experience of their cruelty that i expect to die and be damned simply by reason of the despair into which one of them has cast me and yet so great a fool am i that i cannot but confess that hell coming from her hand is more pleasing than paradise would be from the hand of another parlamente pretending she did not understand that it was touching herself he spoke in this fashion said to him since hell is as pleasant as you say you ought not to fear the devil who has placed you in it if my devil were to become as black as he has been cruel to me answered simontou angrily he would cause the present company as much fright as i find pleasure in looking upon them but the fires of love make me forget those of this hell however to speak no further concerning this matter i give my vote to madame Oisy to tell the second story i feel sure she would support my opinion if she were willing to say what she knows about women forthwith all the company turned towards Oisille, and begged of her to proceed to which she consented and laughing began as follows it seems to me ladies that he who has given me his vote has spoken so ill of our sex in his true story of a wicked woman that i must call to mind all the years of my long life to find one whose virtue will suffice to gainsay his evil opinion however as i have bethought me of one worthy to be remembered i will now relate her history to you End of section 9section 10 of the heptameron of the tales of margaret queen of navarre volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anna simon the heptameron of the tales of margaret queen of navarre volume 1 by margaret of navarre translated by george sainsbury first day tale 2 in the town of Amboise, there was a muleteer in the service of the Queen of Navarre, sister to King Francis, first of that name. She, being at Blois, where she had been brought to bed of a son, the aforesaid muleteer went thither to receive his quarterly payment, whilst his wife remained at Amboise in a lodging beyond the bridges. Now it happened that one of her husband's servants had long loved her exceedingly, and one day he could not refrain from speaking of it to her she however being a truly virtuous woman rebuked him so severely threatening to have him beaten and dismissed by her husband that from that time forth he did not venture to speak to her in any such way again or to let his love be seen but kept the fire hidden within his breast until the day when his master had gone from home and his mistress was at vespers at saint florentin the castle church a long way from the muleteer's house whilst he was alone the fancy took him that he might obtain by force what neither prayer nor service had availed to procure him and accordingly he broke through a wooden partition which was between the chamber where his mistress slept and his own the curtains of his master's bed on the one side and of the servant's bed on the other so covered the walls as to hide the opening he had made and thus his wickedness was not perceived until his mistress was in bed, together with a little girl eleven or twelve years old. When the poor woman was in her first sleep, the servant, in his shirt and with his naked sword in his hand, came through the opening he had made in the wall into her bed. But as soon as she felt him beside her, she leapt out, addressing to him all such reproaches as a virtuous woman might utter. His love, however, was but bestial, and he would have better understood the language of his mules than her honourable reasonings. 
Indeed, he showed himself even more bestial than the beasts with whom he had long consorted. Finding she ran so quickly round the table that he could not catch her, and that she was strong enough to break away from him twice, he despaired of ravishing her alive, and dealt her a terrible sword-trust in the loins, thinking that, if fear and force had not brought her to yield, pain would assuredly do so. The contrary, however, happened, for just as a good soldier, on seeing his own blood, is the more fired to take vengeance on his enemies and win renown, so her chaste heart gathered new strength as she ran fleeing from the hands of the miscreant, saying to him the while all she could think of to bring him to see his guilt. But so filled was he with rage that he paid no heed to her words. He dealt her several more thrusts, to avoid which she continued running as long as her legs could carry her. When, after great loss of blood, she felt that death was near, she lifted her eyes to heaven, clasped her hands, and gave thanks to God, calling him her strength, her patience, and her virtue, and praying him to accept her blood, which had been shed for the keeping of his commandment, and in reverence of his son, through whom she firmly believed all her sins to be washed away, and blotted out from the remembrance of his wrath. As she was uttering the words, "'Lord, receive the soul that has been redeemed by thy goodness,' she fell upon her face to the ground. Then the miscreant dealt her several thrusts, and when she had lost both power of speech and strength of body, and was no longer able to make any defence, he ravished her. Having thus satisfied his wicked lust, he fled in haste, and in spite of all pursuit, was never seen again. The little girl, who was in bed with the muleteer's wife, had hidden herself under the bed in her fear, but on seeing that the man was gone, she came to her mistress. Finding her to be without speech or movement, she called to the neighbours from the window for aid, and as they loved and esteemed her mistress as much as any woman that belonged to the town, they came forthwith, bringing surgeons with them. The latter found that she had received twenty-five mortal wounds in her body, and although they did what they could to help her, it was all in vain. Nevertheless, she lingered for an hour longer without speaking, yet making signs with eye and hand to show that she had not lost her understanding. Being asked by a priest in what faith she died, she answered, by signs as plain as any speech, that she placed her hope of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And so, with glad countenance and eyes upraised to heaven, her chaste body yielded up its soul to its Creator." just as the corpse, having been laid out and shrouded, was placed at the door to await the burial company, the poor husband arrived and beheld his wife's body in front of his house before he had even received tidings of her death. He inquired the cause of this, and found that he had double occasion to grieve, and his grief was indeed so great that it nearly killed him. This martyr of chastity was buried in the church of St. Florentin, and, as was their duty, all the upright women of Amboise failed not to show her every possible honour, deeming themselves fortunate in belonging to a town where so virtuous a woman had been found, and seeing the honour that was shown to the deceased, such women as were wanton and unchaste resolved to amend their lives. This, ladies, is a true story which should incline us more strongly to preserve the fair virtue of chastity. We who are of gentle blood should die of shame on feeling in our hearts that worldly lust to avoid which the poor wife of a muleteer shrank not from so cruel a death. Some esteem themselves virtuous women who have never like this one resisted unto the shedding of blood. It is fitting that we should humble ourselves, for God does not vouchsafe his grace to men because of their birth or riches, but according as it pleases his own good will. He pays no regard to persons, but chooses according to his purpose, and he whom he chooses he honours with all virtues. And often he chooses the lowly to confound those whom the world exalts and honours. For, as he himself hath told us, let us not rejoice in our merits, but rather because our names are written in the book of life, from which nor death, nor hell, nor sin can blot them out. 
there was not a lady in the company but had tears of compassion in her eyes for the pitiful and glorious death of the muleteer's wife each thought within herself that should fortune serve her in the same way she would strive to imitate this poor woman in her martyrdom was he however perceiving that time was being lost in praising the dead woman said to Saffredin, unless you can tell us something that will make the company laugh i think none of them will forgive me for the fault i have committed in making them weep wherefore i give you my vote for your telling of the third story Saffredin, who would gladly have recounted something agreeable to the company and above all to one amongst the ladies said that it was not for him to speak seeing that there were others older and better instructed than himself who should have right come first nevertheless since the lot had fallen upon himself he would rather have done with it at once for the more numerous the good speakers before him the worse would his own tale appear end of section 10section eleven of the heptameron of the tales of margaret queen of navarre volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by anna simon the heptameron of the tales of margaret queen of navarre volume one by margaret of navarre translated by george sainsbury day one tale three Footnote. This story is historical. The events occurred at Naples, circa 1450. End footnote. I have often desired, ladies, to be a sharer in the good fortune of the man whose story I am about to relate to you. You must know that in the time of King Alfonso, whose lust was the sceptre of his kingdom, there lived in the town of Naples a gentleman so honourable, comely, and pleasant that his perfections induced an old gentleman to give him his daughter in marriage. She vied with her husband in grace and comeliness, and there was great love between them, until a certain day in carnival time, when the king went masked from house to house. All strove to give him the best welcome they could, but when he came to this gentleman's house he was entertained better than anywhere else, what with sweetmeats and singers and music and further the fairest woman that to his thinking he had ever seen at the end of the feast she sang a song with her husband in so graceful a fashion that she seemed more beautiful than ever the king perceiving so many perfections united in one person was not over pleased at the gentle harmony between the husband and wife and deliberated how he might destroy it the chief difficulty he met with was in the great affection which he observed existed between them, and on this account he hid his passion in his heart as deeply as he could. To relieve it in some measure, he gave many entertainments to the lords and ladies of Naples, and at these the gentleman and his wife were not forgotten. Now, inasmuch as men willingly believe what they desire, it seemed to the king that the glances of this lady gave him fair promise of future happiness, if only she were not restrained by her husband's presence. Accordingly, that he might learn whether his surmise was true, the king entrusted a commission to the husband, and sent him on a journey to Rome for a fortnight or three weeks. As soon as the gentleman was gone, his wife, who had never before been separated from him, was in great distress. But the king comforted her as often as he was able, with gentle persuasions and presents, so that at last she was not only consoled, but well pleased with her husband's absence. Before the three weeks were over, at the end of which he was to be home again, she had come to be so deeply in love with the king that her husband's return was no less displeasing to her than his departure had been. Not wishing to be deprived of the king's society, she agreed with him that whenever her husband went to his country house she would give him notice of it. He might then visit her in safety, and with such secrecy that her honour, which she regarded more than her conscience, would not suffer. Having this hope, the lady continued a very cheerful mind, and when her husband arrived she welcomed him so heartily that, even had he been told that the king had sought her in his absence, he would have had no suspicion. In course of time, however, 
the flame that is so difficult of concealment began to show itself, and the husband, having a strong inkling of the truth, kept good watch, by which means he was well nigh convinced. Nevertheless, as he feared that the man who wronged him would treat him still worse if he appeared to notice it, he resolved to dissemble, holding it better to live in trouble than to risk his life for a woman who had ceased to love him. In his vexation of spirit, however, he resolved, if he could, to retort upon the king, and knowing that women, especially such as are of lofty and honourable minds, are more moved by resentment than by love, he made bold one day, while speaking with the queen, to tell her that it moved his pity to see her so little loved by the king. The queen, who had heard of the affection that existed between the king and the gentleman's wife, replied, "'I cannot have both honour and pleasure together. I well know that I have the honour, whilst another has the pleasure. And in the same way she who has the pleasure has not the honour that is mine.' Thereupon the gentleman, who understood full well at whom these words were aimed, replied, "'Madam, honour is inborn with you, for your lineage is such that no title, whether of queen or empress, could be an increase of nobility. Yet your beauty, grace, and virtue are well deserving of pleasure, and she who robs you of what is yours does a greater wrong to herself than to you.' seeing that for a glory which is turned to her shame she loses as much pleasure as you or any lady in the realm could enjoy i can truly tell you madam that were the king to lay aside his crown he would not possess any advantage over me in satisfying a lady nay i am sure that to content one so worthy as yourself he would indeed be pleased to change his temperament for mine the queen laughed and replied, "'The king may be of a less vigorous temperament than you, yet the love he bears me contents me well, and I prefer it to any other.' "'Madam,' said the gentleman, "'if that were so, I should have no pity for you. I feel sure that you would be well pleased if the like of your own virtuous love were found in the king's heart. But God has withheld this from you, in order that, not finding what you desire in your husband, you may not make him your god on earth. I confess to you, said the queen, that the love I bear him is so great that the like could not be found in any other heart but mine. Pardon me, madam, said the gentleman, you have not fathomed the love of every heart. I will be so bold as to tell you that you are loved by one whose love is so great and measureless that your own is as nothing beside it. The more he perceives that the king's love fails you, the more does his own wax and increase, in such wise that, were it your pleasure, ye you might be recompensed for all you have lost. The queen began to perceive, both from these words and from the gentleman's countenance, that what he said came from the death of his heart. She remembered also that for a long time he had so zealously sought to do her service that he had fallen into sadness. She had hitherto deemed this to be on account of his wife, but now she was firmly of belief that it was for love of herself. Moreover, the very quality of love which compels itself to be recognized when it is unfeigned made her feel certain of what had been hidden from every one. As she looked at the gentleman, who was far more worthy of being loved than her husband, she reflected that he was forsaken by his wife, as she herself was by the king, and then, beset by vexation and jealousy against her husband, as well as moved by the love of the gentleman, she began with sighs and tearful eyes to say, Ah, me! Shall revenge prevail with me, where love has been of no avail? The gentleman, who understood what these words meant, replied, Vengeance, madam, is sweet when in place of slaying an enemy it gives life to a true lover. Methinks it is time that truth should cause you to abandon the foolish love you bear to one who loves you not, that a just and reasonable love should banish fear, which cannot dwell in a noble and virtuous heart. Come, madam, let us set aside the greatness of your station, and consider that, of all men and women in the world, we are the most deceived, betrayed, and bemocked by those whom we have most truly loved. Let us avenge ourselves, madam, not so much to requite them in the way they deserve, as to satisfy that love which, for my own part, 
I cannot continue to endure and live. And I think that, unless your heart be harder than flint or diamond, you cannot but feel some spark from the fires which only increase the more I seek to conceal them. If pity for me, who am dying of love for you, does not move you to love me, at least pity for yourself should do so. You are so perfect that you deserve to win the heart of every honourable man in the world, yet you are contempt and forsaken by him for whose sake you have scorned all others. On hearing these words, the queen was so greatly moved that, for fear of showing in her countenance the trouble of her mind, she took the gentleman's arm and went forth into a garden that was close to her apartment. There she walked to and fro for a long time without being able to say a word to him. The gentleman saw that she was half won, and when they were at the end of the path, where none could see them, he made a very full declaration of the love which he had so long hidden from her. They found that they were of one mind in the matter, and enacted the vengeance which they were no longer able to forego. Moreover, they there agreed that whenever the husband went into the country, and the king left the castle to visit the wife in the town, the gentleman should always return and come to the castle to see the queen. Thus, the deceivers being themselves deceived, all four would share in the pleasures that two of them had thought to keep to themselves. When the agreement had been made, the queen returned to her apartment, and the gentleman to his house, both being so well pleased that they had forgotten all their former troubles. The jealousy they had previously felt at the king's visits to the lady was now changed to the desire, so that the gentleman went oftener than usual to his house in the country, which was only half a league distant. As soon as the king was advised of his departure, he never failed to go and see the lady, and the gentleman, when night was come, betook himself to the castle to the queen, where he did duty as the king's lieutenant, and so secretly that none ever discovered it. This manner of life lasted for a long time, but as the king was a person of public condition, he could not conceal his love sufficiently well to prevent it from coming at length to the knowledge of every one, and all honourable people felt great pity for the gentleman, though diverse malicious youths were wont to deride him by making horns at him behind his back. But he knew of their derision, and it gave him great pleasure so that he came to think as highly of his horns as of the king's crown. One day, however, the king and the gentleman's wife, noticing a stag's head that was set up in the gentleman's house, could not refrain in his presence from laughing and saying that the head was suited to the house. Soon afterwards the gentleman, who was no less spirited than the king, caused the following words to be written over the stag's head. Io porto le corna, chiascun lo vede. Ma tal le porta che no lo crede. Footnote. All men may see the horns I've got, but one wears horns and knows it not. End footnote. When the king came again to the house, he observed these lines newly written, and inquired their meaning of the gentleman, who said, If the king's secret be hidden from the subject, it is not fitting that the subject's secret should be revealed to the king. Be content with knowing that those who wear horns do not always have their caps raised from their heads. Some horns are so soft that they never uncap one, and especially are they light to him who thinks he has them not. The king perceived by these words that the gentleman knew something of his own behaviour, but he never had any suspicion of the love between him and the queen, for the more pleased the latter was with the life led by her husband, the more did she feign to be distressed by it. And so, on either side, they lived in this love, until at last old age took them in hand. Here, ladies, is a story by which you may be guided, for, as I willingly confess, it shows you that when your husbands give you buck's horns, you can give them stag's horns in return. I am quite sure, Saffredon, began Anna Suite, laughing, that if you still love as ardently as you were formerly wont to do, you would submit to horns as big as oak trees, if only you might repay them as you pleased. However, now that your hair is growing grey, it is time to leave your desires in peace. Fair lady, said Saffrenant, though I be robbed of hope by the woman I love, and of ardour by old age, yet it lies not in my power to weaken my inclination. 
since you have rebuked me for so honourable a desire, I give you my vote for the telling of the fourth tale, that we may see whether you can bring forward some example to refute me. During this converse, one of the ladies fell to laughing heartily, knowing that she who took Saffredon's words to herself was not so loved by him that he would have suffered horns, shame or wrong for her sake. When Saffredon perceived that the lady who laughed understood him, he was well satisfied and became silent, so that Anna Sweet might begin, which she did as follows. In order, ladies, that Saffredon and the rest of the company may know that all ladies are not like the queen he has spoken of, and that all foolhardy and venturesome men do not compass their ends, I will tell you a story in which I will acquaint you with the opinion of a lady who deemed the vexation of failure and love to be harder of endurance than death itself. However, I shall give no names, because the events are so fresh in people's minds that I should fear to offend some who are near of kin. End of section 11《Section 12 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. — The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1, by Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. First Day, Tale 4. Footnote. This story is historical, and the incidents must have occurred between 1520 and 1525. End footnote. There lived in the land of Flanders a lady of such high lineage that none more illustrious could be found. She was a widow, both her first and second husbands being dead, and she had no children living. During her widowhood she lived in retirement with her brother, by whom she was greatly loved, and who was a very great lord and married to the daughter of a king. This young prince was a man much given to pleasure, fond of hunting, pastimes, and women, as his youth inclined him. He had a wife, however, who was of a very forward disposition, and found no pleasure in her husband's pursuits, wherefore this lord always took his sister along with his wife, for she was a most joyous and pleasant companion, and withal a discreet and honourable woman. In this lord's household there was a gentleman who, for stature, comeliness, and grace, surpassed all his fellows. This gentleman, perceiving that his master's sister was of merry mood, and always ready for a laugh, was minded to try whether the offer of an honourable love would be displeasing to her. He made this offer, but the answer that he received from her was contrary to his desires. However, although her reply was such as beseemed a princess and a woman of true virtue, she readily pardoned his hardihood for the sake of his comeliness and breeding, and let him know that she bore him no ill-will for what he had said. But she charged him never to speak to her after that fashion again. And this he promised, that he might not lose the pleasure and honour of her conversation. Nevertheless, as time went on, his love so increased that he forgot the promise he had made. He did not, however, risk further trial of words, for he had learned by experience, and much against his will, what virtuous replies she was able to make. But he reflected that if he could take her somewhere at a disadvantage, she, being a widow, young, lusty, and of a lively humour, would perchance take pity on him and on herself. To compass his ends, he told his master that excellent hunting was to be had in the neighbourhood of his house and that if it pleased him to repair thither, and hunt three or four stags in the month of May, he could have no finer sport. The lord granted the gentleman's request, as much for the affection he bore him as for the pleasure of the chase, and repaired to his house, which was as handsome and as fairly ordered as that of the richest gentleman in the land. The lord and his lady were lodged on one side of the house, and she whom the gentleman loved more than himself on the other. Her apartment was so well arranged, tapestried above and matted below, that it was impossible to perceive a trap-door which was by the side of her bed, and which opened into a room beneath, that was occupied by the gentleman's mother. She being an old lady, somewhat troubled by room, and fearful lest the cuff she had should disturb the princess, 
made exchange of chambers with her son. In the evening this old lady was wont to bring sweetmeats to the princess for her collation, at which the gentleman was present, and being greatly beloved by her brother and intimate with him, he was also suffered to be present when she rose in the morning and when she retired to bed, on which occasions he always found reasons for an increase of his affection. Thus it came to pass that one evening he made the princess stay up very late, until at last, being desirous of sleep, she bade him leave her. He then went to his own room, and there put on the handsomest and best-scented shirt he had, and a nightcap so well adorned that nothing was lacking in it. It seemed to him, as he looked at himself in his mirror, that no lady in the world could deny herself to one of his comeliness and grace. He therefore promised himself a happy issue to his enterprise, and so lay down on his bed, where in his desire and sure hope of exchanging it for one more honourable and pleasant, he looked to make no very long stay. As soon as he had dismissed all his attendants, he rose to fasten the door after them, and for a long time he listened to hear whether there were any sound in the room of the princess, which was above his own. When he had made sure that all was quiet, he wished to begin his pleasant task, and little by little let down the trap-door, which was so excellently wrought, and so well covered with cloth, that it made not the least noise. Then he ascended into the room, and came to the bedside of his lady, who was just falling asleep. Forthwith, having no regard for the duty that he owed his mistress, or for the house to which she belonged, he got into bed with her, without entreating her permission, or making any kind of ceremony. She felt him in her arms before she knew that he had entered the room. But being strong, she freed herself from his grasp, and fell to striking, biting and scratching him, demanding the while to know who he was, so that for fear lest she should call out, he sought to stop her mouth with the bedclothes. But this he found it impossible to do, for when she saw that he was using all his strength to work her shame, she did as much to baffle him. She further called as loudly as she could to her lady of honour, who slept in her room, and this old and virtuous woman ran to her mistress in her night-dress. When the gentleman saw that he was discovered, he was so fearful of being recognised by the lady that he descended in all haste through this trap-door, his despair at returning in such an evil plight being no less than his desire and assurance of a gracious reception had previously been. He found his mirror and candle on his table, and, looking at his face, all bleeding from the lady's scratches and bites, whence the blood was trickling over his fine shirt, which had now more blood than gold about it, he said, Beauty, now hast thou been rewarded according to thy deserts. By reason of thy vain promises I attempted an impossible undertaking, and one that, instead of increasing my happiness, will perchance double my misfortune. I feel sure that if she knows I made this foolish attempt, contrary to the promise I gave her, I shall lose the honourable and accustomed companionship which more than any other I have had with her. And my folly has well deserved this, for if I was to turn my good looks and grace to any account, I ought not to have hidden them in the darkness. I should not have sought to take that chaste body by force, but should have waited in long service and humble patience till love had conquered her. Without love all man's merits and might are of no avail." Thus he passed the night in tears, regrets, and sorrowings such as I cannot describe, and in the morning, finding his face greatly torn, he feigned grievous sickness and to be unable to endure the light until the company had left his house. The lady who had come off victorious knew that there was no man at her brother's court that durst attempt such an enterprise save him who had had the boldness to declare his love to her. She therefore concluded that it was indeed her host and made search through the room with her lady of honour to discover how he could have entered it. But in this she failed, whereupon she said to her companion in great anger, "'You may be sure that it can have been none other than the lord of this house, and I will make such report of him to my brother in the morning that his head shall bear witness to my chastity.' Seeing her in such wrath, the lady of honour said to her, "'Right glad am I, madam, to find you esteem your honour so highly that, to exalt it, you would not spare the life of a man who, for the love he bears you, has put it to this risk. But it often happens that one lessens what one thinks to increase. 
wherefore i pray you madam tell me the truth of the whole matter when the lady had fully related the business the lady of honour said to her you assure me that he had nothing from you save only scratches and blows i do assure you that it was so said the lady and unless he find a rare surgeon i am certain his face will bear the marks to-morrow well since it is thus madam said the lady of honour it seems to me that you have more reason to thank god than to think of vengeance for you may well believe that since the gentleman had spirit enough to make such an attempt his grief at having failed will be harder of endurance than any death you could award him if you desire to be revenged on him let love and shame do their work they will torment him more grievously than could you and if you would speak out for your honour's sake beware madam lest you fall into a mishap like to his own he instead of obtaining the greatest delight he could imagine has encountered the gravest vexation any gentleman could endure so you madam thinking to exalt your honour may perchance diminish it if you make complaint you will bring to light what is known to none for you may rest assured that the gentleman on his side will never reveal aught of the matter and even if my lord your brother should do justice to him at your asking and the poor gentleman should die yet would it everywhere be noised abroad that he had had his will of you and most people would say it was unlikely a gentleman would make such an attempt unless the lady had given him great encouragement you are young and fair you live gaily with all and there is no one at court but has seen the kind treatment you have shown to the gentleman whom you suspect hence every one will believe that if he did this deed it was not without some fault on your side and your honour for which you have never had to blush will be freely questioned wherever the story is related on hearing the excellent reasoning of her lady of honour the princess perceived that she spoke the truth and that she herself would with just cause be blamed on account of the close friendship which she had always shown towards the gentleman accordingly she inquired of her lady of honour what she ought to do madam replied the other since you are pleased to receive my counsels having regard for the affection whence they spring it seems to me you should be glad at heart to think that the most comely and gallant gentleman i have ever seen was not able whether by love or by force to turn you from the path of true virtue for this madam you should humble yourself before god and confess that it was not through your own merit for many women who have led straighter lives than you have been humiliated by men less worthy of love than he and you should henceforth be more than ever on your guard against proposals of love for many have the second time yielded to dangers which on the first occasion they were able to avoid be mindful madam that love is blind and that it makes people blind in such wise that the way appears safest just when it is most slippery further madam it seems to me that you should give no sign of what has befallen you whether to him or to any one else and that if he seeks to say anything on the matter you should feign not to understand him in this way you will avoid two dangers the one of vain glory in the victory you have won and the other of recalling things so pleasant to the flesh that mention of them the chastest can only with difficulty avoid feeling some sparks of the flame though they strive their utmost to escape them besides this madam in order that he may not think he has done anything pleasing in your sight i am of opinion you should little by little withdraw the friendship you have been in the habit of showing him in this way he will know how much you scorn his rashness and how great is your goodness since content with the victory that god has given you you seek no further vengeance upon him and may god give you grace madam to continue in the virtue he has placed in your heart and knowing that all good things come from him may you love and serve him better than before the princess determined to abide by the advice of her lady of honour and then fell asleep with joy as great as was the sadness of her waking lover on the morrow the lord her brother wishing to depart inquired for his host and was told that he was too ill to bear the light or to hear any one speak the prince was greatly astonished at this and wished to go and see the gentleman however learning that he was asleep he would not awake him but left the house without bidding him farewell he took with him his wife and sister and the latter hearing the excuses sent by the gentleman who would not see the prince or any of the company before their departure 
felt convinced that it was indeed he who had so tormented her, and that he durst not let the marks which she had left upon his face be seen. And although his master frequently sent for him, he did not return to court until he was quite healed of all his wounds, save only one, namely that which love and vexation had dealt to his heart. When he did return and found himself in presence of his victorious foe, he could not but blush, and such was his confusion that he who had formerly been the boldest of all the company was often wholly abashed before her. Accordingly, being now quite certain that her suspicion was true, she estranged herself from him little by little, though not so adroitly that he did not perceive it. But he durst not give any sign for fear of meeting with something still worse, and so he kept his love concealed, patiently enduring the disgrace he had so well deserved. This, ladies, is a story which should be a warning to those who would grasp at what does not belong to them, and which further should strengthen the hearts of ladies, since it shows the virtue of this young princess and the good sense of her lady of honour. If the like fortune should befall any among you, the remedy has now been pointed out. It seems to me, said Hircan, that the tall gentleman of whom you have told us was so lacking in spirit as to be unworthy of being remembered. With such an opportunity as that, he ought not to have suffered any one, old or young, to baffle him in his enterprise. It must be said also that his heart was not entirely filled with love, seeing that fear of death and shame found place within it. And what, replied Nomafide, could the poor gentleman have done with two women against him? He ought to have killed the old one, said Hircan, and when the young one found herself without assistance, she would have been already half subdued. To have killed her, said Nomafide, then you would turn a lover into a murderer. Since such is your opinion, it would indeed be a fearful thing to fall into your hands. If I had gone so far, said Hircan, I should have felt it dishonourable not to achieve my purpose. Then said Giberon, You think it strange that a princess, bred in all honour, should prove difficult of capture to one man. You should then be much more astonished at a poor woman who escaped out of the hands of two. Giberon, said Ennesweet, I give my vote to you to tell the fifth tale, for I think you know something concerning this poor woman that will not be displeasing to us. Since you have chosen me, said Giberon, I will tell you a story which I know to be true, from having made inquiries concerning it on the spot. By this story you will see that womanly sense and virtue are not in the hearts and heads of princesses alone, nor love and cunning in such as are most often deemed to possess them. End of section 12「Section 13 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. By Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. Day 1. Tale 5. At the haven of Coulon, near Niort, there lived a boatwoman who, day or night, did nothing but convey passengers across the ferry. Now it chanced that two grey friars from Niort were crossing the river alone with her, and as the passage is one of the longest in France, they began to make love to her, that she might not feel dull by the way. She returned them the answer that was due, but they, being neither fatigued by their journeying, nor cooled by the water, nor put to shame by her refusal, determined to take her by force, and, if she clamoured, to throw her into the river. She, however, was as virtuous and clever as they were gross and wicked, and said to them, I am not so ill-disposed as I seem to be, but I pray you grant me two requests. You shall then see that I am more ready to give than you are to ask." The friars swore to her by their good St. Francis that she could ask nothing that they would not grant in order to have what they desired of her. First of all, she said, 
I require you both to promise on oath that you will inform no man living of this matter. This they promised right willingly. Then, she continued, I would have you take your pleasure with me one after the other, for it would be too great a shame for me to have to do with one in presence of the other. Consider which of you will have me first. They deemed her request a very reasonable one, and the younger friar yielded the first place to the elder. Then, as they were drawing near a little island, she said to the younger one, "'Good father, say your prayers here until I have taken your companion to another island. Then, if he praises me when he comes back, we will leave him here and go away in turn together.' The younger friar leapt out onto the island to await the return of his comrade, whom the boatwoman took away with her to another island. When they had reached the bank, she said to him, pretending the while to fasten her boat to a tree, "'Look, my friend, and see where we can place ourselves.' The good father stepped onto the island to seek for a convenient spot, but no sooner did she see him on land than she struck her foot against the tree and went off with her boat into the open stream, leaving both the good fathers to their deserts, and crying out to them as loudly as she could, "'Wait now, sirs, till the angel of God comes to console you.' for you shall have naught that could please you from me to-day. The two poor monks, perceiving that they had been deceived, knelt down at the water's edge and besought her not to put them to such shame, and they promised that they would ask nothing of her if she would of our goodness take them to the haven. But, still rowing away, she said to them, I should be doubly foolish if, after escaping out of your hands, I were to put myself into them again. When she had come to the village, she went to call her husband and the ministers of justice, that they might go and take these fierce wolves, from whose fangs she had by the grace of God escaped. They set out, accompanied by many people, for there was no one, big or little, but wished to share in the pleasure of this chase. When the poor brethren saw such a large company approaching, they hid themselves each in his island, even as Adam did when he perceived his nakedness in the presence of God. Shame set their sin clearly before them, and the fear of punishment made them tremble so that they were half dead. Nevertheless, they were taken prisoners amid the mockings and hootings of men and women. Some said, These good fathers preach chastity to us and then rob our wives of theirs. Others said, They are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Then another voice cried, By their fruits shall you know what manner of trees they are. You may be sure that all the passages in the gospel condemning hypocrites were brought forward against the unhappy prisoners, who were, however, rescued and delivered by their warden, who came in all haste to claim them, assuring the ministers of justice that he would visit them with a greater punishment than laymen would venture to inflict and that they should make reparation by saying as many masses and prayers as might be required. The judge granted the warden's request, and gave the prisoners up to him, and the warden, who was an upright man, so dealt with them that they never afterwards crossed the river without making the sign of the cross and recommending themselves to God. I pray you, ladies, consider, since this poor boatwoman had the wit to deceive two such evil men, what should be done by those who have read of and witnessed so many fair examples, and who have had the goodness of virtuous ladies ever before their eyes? Indeed, the virtue of well-bred women is not so much to be called virtue as habit. It is in the women who know nothing, who hear scarcely two good sermons during the whole year, who have no leisure to think of aught save the gaining of their miserable livelihood, and who nevertheless jealously guard their chastity, hard-pressed as they may be, it is in such women as these that one discovers the virtue that is natural to the heart. Where man's wit and might are smallest, there the Spirit of God performs the greatest work. And unhappy indeed is the lady who keeps not close ward over the treasure which brings her so much honour if it be well guarded, and so much shame if it be neglected. "'It seems to me, Gibbon,' said Longarine, that there is no great virtue in refusing a grey friar, and that it would rather be impossible to love one. Longarine, replied 
Geberon. They who are not accustomed to such lovers as yours do by no means despise the grey friars, for the latter are as handsome and as strong as we are, and they are readier and fresher also, for we are worn out with our service. Moreover, they talk like angels, and are as importunate as a devil, so that such women as have never seen other robes than their coarse drugged ones, are truly virtuous when they escape out of their hands. "'In faith,' said Nomafi in a loud voice, "'you may say what you like, but I would rather be thrown into the river than lie with a grey friar.' "'So you can swim well,' said Wasiya, laughing. Nomafide took this question in bad part, for she thought that she was esteemed by Wasiya less highly than she desired. Accordingly, she answered in anger, "'There are some who have refused more agreeable men than grey friars, without blowing a trumpet about it.' Wasiya laughed to see her so wrathful, and said to her, "'Still less do they beat a drum about what they have done and granted.' "'I see,' said Geberon, "'that Nomafide wishes to speak.' I therefore give her my vote that she may relieve her heart in telling us some excellent story. What has just been said, replied Nomarfid, touches me so little that it affords me neither pleasure nor pain. However, since I have your vote, I pray you listen to me, whilst I show that, although one woman used cunning for a good purpose, others have been crafty for evil's sake. Since we have sworn to tell the truth, I will not hide it. For just as the boatwoman's virtue brings no honour to other women unless they follow her example, so the vice of another cannot disgrace her. Wherefore, listen. End of section 13「Section 14 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1, by Margaret of Navarre, translated by George Sainsbury. Day 1, Tale 6. There was in the service of Charles, last Duke of Alençon, an old valet who had lost an eye, and who was married to a wife much younger than himself. Now, since his master and mistress liked him as well as any man of his condition that was in their service, he was not able to visit his wife as often as he could have wished. Owing to this, she so far forgot her honour and conscience as to fall in love with a young man, and the affair being at last noised abroad, the husband heard of it. He could not believe it, however, on account of the many notable tokens of love that were shown him by his wife. Nevertheless, he one day determined to put the matter to the test, and to take revenge, if he were able, on the woman who had put him to such shame. For this purpose he pretended to go away to a place a short distance off for the space of two or three days. As soon as he was gone, his wife sent for her lover, but he had not been with her for half an hour when the husband arrived and knocked loudly at the door. The wife well knew who it was, and told her lover— who was so greatly confounded that he would fain have been in his mother's womb, and cursed both his mistress and the love that had brought him into such peril. However, she bade him fear nothing, for she would devise a means to get him away without harm or shame to him, and she told him to dress himself as quickly as he could. All this time the husband was knocking at the door and calling to his wife at the top of his voice, but she feigned not to recognize him, and cried out to the people of the house, why do you not get up and silence those who are making such a clamour at the door? Is this an hour to come to the houses of honest folk? If my husband were here, he would soon make them desist. On hearing his wife's voice, the husband called to her as loudly as he could, Wife, open the door. Are you going to keep me waiting here till morning? Then, when she saw that her lover was ready to set forth, she opened the door. Oh, husband, she began, how glad I am that you are come! I have just had a wonderful dream, and was so pleased that I never before knew such delight, for it seemed to me that you had recovered the sight of your eye. Then, embracing and kissing him, she took him by the head, and covering his good eye with one hand, she asked him, Do you not see better than you did before? At that moment, whilst he saw not a whit, 
she made her lover sally forth the husband immediately suspected the trick and said to her for god wife i'll keep watch on you no more for in thinking to deceive you i have myself met with the cunningest deception that ever was devised may god mend you for it is beyond the power of man to put a stop to the maliciousness of a woman unless by killing her outright however since the fair treatment i have accorded you has availed nothing for your amendment perchance the scorn i shall henceforward hold you in will serve as a punishment so saying he went away leaving his wife in great distress nevertheless by the intercession of his friends and her own excuses and tears he was persuaded to return to her again by this tale ladies you may see how quick and crafty a woman is in escaping from danger and if her wit be quick to discover the means of concealing a bad deed it would in my belief be yet more subtle in avoiding evil or in doing good for i have always heard it said that wit to do well is ever the stronger you may talk of your cunning as much as you please said hercan but my opinion is that had the same fortune befallen you you could not have concealed the truth i had as lief you deemed me the most foolish woman on earth she replied i do not say that answered hercan but i think you more likely to be confounded by slander than to devise some cunning means to silence it you think said nomafide that every one is like you who would use one slander for the patching of another but there is danger lest the patch impair what it patches and the foundation be so overladen that all be destroyed however if you think that the subtlety of which all believe you to be fully possessed is greater than that found in women i yield place to you to tell the seventh story and if you bring yourself forward as the hero i doubt not that we shall hear wickedness enough i am not here replied hercan to make myself out worse than i am there are some who do that rather more than is to my liking so saying he looked at his wife who quickly said do not fear to tell the truth on my account i can more easily bear to hear you relate your crafty tricks than to see them played before my eyes though none of them could lessen the love i bear you for that reason replied hercan i make no complaint of all the false opinions you have had of me and so since we understand each other there will be more security for the future yet i am not so foolish as to relate a story of myself the truth of which might be vexatious to you i will tell you one of a gentleman who was among my dearest friends End of section fourteen. Section 15 of the Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Heptameron of the Tales of Margaret, Queen of Navarre, Volume 1, by Margaret of Navarre. Translated by George Sainsbury. First Day, Tale 7 in the city of paris there lived a merchant who was in love with a young girl of his neighbourhood or to speak more truly she was more in love with him than he with her for the show he made to her of love and devotion was but to conceal a loftier and more honourable passion however she suffered herself to be deceived and loved him so much that she had quite forgotten the way to refuse after the merchant had long taken trouble to go where he could see her he at last made her come whithersoever it pleased himself her mother discovered this and being a very virtuous woman she forbade her daughter ever to speak to the merchant on pain of being sent to a nunnery but the girl whose love for the merchant was greater than her fear of her mother went after him more than ever it happened one day when she was in a closet all alone, the merchant came in to her, and finding himself in a place convenient for the purpose, fell to conversing with her as privily as was possible. But a maid-servant, who had seen him go in, ran and told the mother, who betook herself thither in great wrath. When the girl heard her coming, she said, weeping, to the merchant, 
alas sweetheart the love that i bear you will now cost me dear here comes my mother who will know for certain what she has always feared and suspected the merchant who was not a bit confused by this accident straightway left the girl and went to meet the mother stretching out his arms he hugged her with all his might and with the same ardour with which he had begun to entertain the daughter threw the poor old woman on to a small bed she was so taken aback at being thus treated that she could find nothing to say but what do you want are you dreaming for all that he ceased not to press her as closely as if she had been the fairest maiden in the world and had she not cried out so loudly that her serving men and women came to her aid she would have gone by the same road as she feared her daughter was treading however the servants dragged the poor old woman by main force out of the merchant's arms and she never knew for what reason he had thus used her meanwhile her daughter took refuge in a house hard by where a wedding was going on since then she and the merchant have oft-times laughed together at the expense of the old woman who was never any the wiser by this story ladies you may see how by the subtlety of a man an old woman was deceived and the honour of a young one saved any one who would give the names or had seen the merchant's face and the consternation of the old woman would have a very tender conscience to hold from laughing it is sufficient for me to prove to you by this story that a man's wit is as prompt and as helpful at a pinch as a woman's and thus to show you ladies that you need not fear to fall into man's hands if your own wit should fail you you will find theirs prepared to shield your honour in truth hercan said longarine i grant that the tale is a very pleasant one and the wit great but the example is not such as maids should follow i readily believe there are some whom you would fain have approve it but you are not so foolish as to wish that your wife or her whose honour you set higher than her pleasure should play such a game i believe there is none who would watch them more closely or shield them more readily than you by my conscience said hircan if she whom you mention had done such a thing and i knew nothing about it i should think none the less of her for all i know some one may have played as good a trick on me however knowing nothing i am unconcerned at this parlamente could not refrain from saying a wicked man cannot but be suspicious happy are those who give no occasion for suspicion i have never seen a great fire from which there came no smoke said longarine but i have often seen smoke where there was no fire the wicked are as suspicious when there is no mischief as when there is truly longarine hircan forthwith rejoined you have spoken so well in support of the honour of ladies wrongfully suspected that i give you my vote to tell the eighth tale i hope however that you will not make us weep as madame oisille did by too much praise of virtuous women at this longarine laughed heartily and thus began you want me to make you laugh as is my wont but it shall not be at women's expense i will show you however how easy it is to deceive them when they are inclined to be jealous and esteem themselves clever enough to deceive their husbands end of section 15